a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Our friends and neighbors, the Goldbergs. Brought to you by the makers of new high-test Oxidol. Folks, something big has happened to soap. Something of great importance to women bothered by sneezy soap. There's no need now for you to sacrifice washing efficiency in avoiding sneezy soap dust. Today's Oxidol is marvelously sneeze-proof. Marvelously free of sneezy soap dust. No other soap of its type can beat it, but, and this is important, Oxidol is made to prevent sneezy soap dust without coarsening the soap without slowing up speed of sudsing, and with no lessening of that famous whitewashing power and safety which made it the choice of millions. Remember, when buying laundry soap, today's Oxidol is amazingly sneeze-proof without the slightest loss in washing performance. So, switch to high-test Oxidol, the famous whiter washing, thicker sudsing soap that's been singled out and officially recommended by a group of leading washing machine manufacturers, large responsible companies like Apex, with 20 years of first-hand experience with home laundering problems. And here's a sample of the advice those experts give their users. For sparkling, snowy white clothes with speed and safety, use high-test Oxidol. We officially recommend it. You see, Apex is not leaving anything to chance, no sure, because they've had conclusive proof that Oxidol washes clothes as much as 9 to 11 pentometer shades whiter than old-style bar and package soap, safely. Yes, and that Oxidol gives up to three times the suds, cup for cup. Rich, active suds that help get you through a big family wash in a jiffy. Well, you wonder they say Oxidol's an ideal soap? So do you wonder they officially recommend Oxidol for use in the thousands and thousands of Apex washers they sell? Which reminds me, washer owners, the Apex washer people are not only recommending Oxidol, but demonstrating it. Yes, all this week, Apex dealers everywhere are demonstrating Oxidol in the famous new Apex Speed Liner Washer without cost or obligation. And believe me, I hope you'll make the most of it. I hope you'll see your nearest Apex dealer today. Because my, oh my, what a sight you'll see. Yes, ma'am. A thrilling preview of the miracles Oxidol can perform for you every wash day. And now, the Goldberg. Molly and the rest of her family are basking in the pleasure of being south at the home of the Allisons. It's the new life, the different town, the change in atmosphere, but mostly it's the fact that Molly enjoys being with the family of the girl whom her son Sammy is going to marry. Unfortunately, Sammy isn't there. Mr. Allison says that Sammy's away on business, and Molly and Jake and Rosie are impatiently waiting for Sammy to return. But Sammy may not. The truth is, that Sammy discovered how false and rotten Sylvia was, quarreled and left. Sylvia's hoping against hope that Sammy will come back. And meanwhile, she and her unwilling father are keeping the fiction of Sammy being away on business alive. But their secret is threatened by the fact that a telegram arrived in Lastonbury for Molly. Sylvia told Martha to send it unopened in a letter to the South. What if Molly finds out? And who's the telegram from? Well... Sylvia is just as curious, and she takes a moment off from entertaining the woman who may never be her mother-in-law to find out. Listen. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on, Mr. Goldberg. Yes, all right. And they'll tell you if they're looking for the pictures of the family out for me. Oh, all right. I just want to call Dad. You said you'd better put on your wedding dress and I can see it. All All right. All right. Hello? Allison's department star, please. Oh, Oh, that's my sister Leah's husband, Leah. Oh, we're looking through the album. Is that all right? Yes, of course. Oh, hello? Sylvia, when are we going to see your wedding? Well, hello, just a minute, Daddy. Do you want me to send you? Oh, please. Uh, there'll be a draft for your mother with it open. Uh, hello? Daddy? Daddy, did that letter with the telegram from Martha Wilberforce come from last year? Oh, it did? The letter came with the telegram? Well... What did the telegram say? What's it from Sam? Well, why can't you tell me? Well, who's with you? Oh, Mr. Goldberg with you now? 
Then you must bite them. Say so yes or no, Daddy. Well, tell me, Daddy, what to bring Fanny. Yes or no? Uh, oh, I did just do you Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm... that's all right. Uh, hello? Uh, hello? Did I disturb your call? Uh, no, I, I was just calling Daddy. Oh, uh, Rosalie, dear, what is wrong? Oh, oh. <laughs> Daddy, you look beautiful. She's here on this picture. Oh, which one? <laughs> Oh, oh. And, and, oh, my, this is your sister that you understood? Mm-hmm. I like to see. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're up here. How old were you in this picture, Sylvia? Oh, about five, I guess. Five. Do you remember anything about yourself that far back? Yes, me. I do. What do you remember when you were five? Oh, you pulling my hair when you combed in and you see me washing my face, and that's all I can remember. Can you remember anything from the time you were five, Mark? Mm, well, looking back at all your different selves is like, uh, how shall I say, looking, to, looking through a looking glass like Alice in Wonderland. And you think when you look, uh, <laughs> is this me? Is, uh, is this I? Can this be me? <laughs> you're different people at different times in your life. And, and sometimes you're ashamed to remember that some of yourself Things you did, things you said. <laughs> but have your eyes? Yeah. Sometimes I think people never can change, no matter how they try. You may hate yourself or be ashamed. The best you can do is try to forget. Forgetting uh, can be part of changing. I think a person should accept what they are. See what they are. Be themselves. Then the world would never get any better. Has it ever? You're very pessimistic, Sylvia. I'm realistic. You're young. A change takes a long time. You can only see that it happens when you have time to look back. And for you, Sylvia, and for you, Rosalie, <laughs> there's so, so little looking back possible yet. It's all, uh, it's all looking forward. And who, who is this? Huh? Who is this, Sylvia? My mother. Oh. oh. Well, uh... All right, Rosalie, darling. So there's a pretty ready picture, so um, it is. Sylvia, are you going to put on your dress? <laughs> Still, Rosalie, <laughs> maybe Sylvia's tired. Please, Sylvia, I want to see it. You saw it, Rosalie. On a hat. I oh. put it on. You want me to help you? No, I'll manage. You stay with your mother. All right, Sylvia. Mama, darling. Well, Mama, darling, you must never judge a person away from their own house. What do you mean? Sophie is much nicer here than she was in Lestonbury when she was with us. I think so, too, Rosalie. I like her much better. Me, too. Sammy's influence more. Maybe. You can see it. Maybe. She's quieter and gentler. She's much more like Sammy. You think so, Rosalie? Mm-hmm. That always happens between two people. Yes, Mama, yes. The one that has the stronger will or the best character dominant. It's a rule, Mama, darling. It happens to everybody. It isn't much to happen to you. To me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who dominated your marriage, Ma? You or Pop? Papa? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, why don't you think so? Because you are the power behind the throne, Ma. There's no power, Rosalie, darling. Pa- Papa and me have a partnership. That's what <laughs> you say. Papa's the head of the house, Rosalie. You think so? Then it is so. You want him to think so? Rosalie. <laughs> We're just discussing your question, Ma. There's the discussions and there's discussions. <laughs> but, Ma... <laughs> Are you happy now? And you know, I'll see family. I'll be happy. They expect him back any day now. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's what I said. Ma, be very nice to Sylvie. Am I not? I, I mean, as much as you can, do you? Yes. Did you see her face when, when she looked at her mother's picture? Mm-hmm. This is the china. The girl misses her mother most when, when she's getting married. I believe in young marriages, don't you, Ma? I'd like to meet somebody when I'm young and fall in love and get married and, and, and get it over with, too. What's your hurry? I want to have you with me in, in all the important things in my life. I want to get married young so, so you can be with me, play in a house with me and, and be active and, and everything a mother can do when, when she's young enough to be enthusiastic about things. And I want to have a family when you're young enough to enjoy it with me. Even when you become a grandmother, Ma, I want you to be a young one. I want my children to know you just the way you are now, the way I know you. 
How old is she with the old little guy? Take, take, take the phone, dear. Huh? Can you still be you take it more? She's upstairs. She's getting into dress. Take it out. Oh, maybe it's Papa, maybe it's Seth. Hello? Yes? Yes, Lou. Who? Seth. Lessonberry calling? Lessonberry? Oh, calling who? Oh, calling who? Oh, he's him. I, it, it's for you. Who? Oh. It's Martha Wilmerson. Martha Wilmerson. Uh-huh. Uh, hello? Uh, hello, Martha? Yeah? Yeah, that's me. What do you mean, then, I got here? Well, I'm here now. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, please? Yes, uh, uh, hello, Martha? Hello, Martha. Hello, Martha. Hold the wire. Hold the wire, Martha. Oh, how did you get Martha before? Yes. Martha, my, my son, Martha, we were from Lesson Day. Hold on, Martha. Let me look at you. Oh, let me look at you. Hello, Martha. Martha, Sylvia just came down in her wedding dress and she, she looks like a picture in a frame. Huh? What? What telegram? Oh, we sent a telegram, Sammy and I. Uh, just a minute, Martha. We were, we were expecting to hear from you. Yeah. We didn't, so Sammy and I sent you a telegram asking you when you were coming. And the telegram got there way after you left, and well, so Martha got it. Oh. Uh, oh. Hello, Martha. Martha, don't worry about it, dear. Yeah. Well, don't bother sending it. Why should you send it? Well, uh, well Martha called and asked what we wanted to do with the telegram before you arrived. Just a minute. Hello, Martha, just one minute. H- hold one minute. D- don't hang. Cold, dear. But what for you? Oh, well, Martha called and asked what we want to do with the telegram yeah. before you came. And, well, I told her not to open it, but to send it to me here. Oh. Oh, you, you thought... Oh. Yes. Uh, hello, Martha. Hello, Martha. You sent it already in an envelope? To me? Oh, in Sierra. That's right. Oh, tell her not to worry about hello, it. Hello, Martha. Uh, there's nothing in the telegram. Nothing. Uh, huh? Oh, hold the wire. Hold the wire. Uh, Sylvie, did you got a letter yet? Uh, no. No. Um, hello, Martha. Don't worry. Don't worry. It was nothing in the telegram. Only the children wanted to know when we was coming. Don't worry, dear. Everything is wonderful. I only wish you could be here to see the wedding dress. I'll be sat in my house. I'll be sat with Carol. With Paul. And a long train. And a long train. Uh-huh. And a long sleeve. Uh-huh. And what kind of thing is Sylvia? What kind of thing? The telephone should also have a lie detector in it. But the telegram has come. And it wasn't sent by Sylvia. Now, maybe you thought all I was telling you before the program sounded just too good to be true. About how Oxidol is made to prevent sneezy soap dust without poisoning. How Oxidol is so remarkably sneeze-free, yet amazingly efficient and fast. And about how gorgeously white Oxidol gets clothes quickly and safely. So please, washer owners... For your own sake, go to your nearest Apex washer dealer and see for yourself. For remember, the makers of the famous Apex washers are now recommending Oxidol officially and exclusively for use in their washers. And all this week, Apex dealers everywhere are demonstrating Oxidol in the brand new 1941 Apex Speedliner washer. Oh, no, no, no cost or obligation, but a positive revelation of what Oxidol can mean to you every wash day. In whiteness, speed, safety, and comfort. And be sure to listen to the next episode of The Goldbergs. Molly hears a voice which suddenly sends her heart racing with fear and terror. And this is James Fleming saying goodbye from the makers of High Test Oxidol. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary division. You get a call that an important piece of religious art has been stolen from the oldest church in Los Angeles. There's no lead to its whereabouts. Your job? Find it.
the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step-by-step step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, December 24th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of burglary division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. I'd gone across the street to buy stamps for some Christmas cards I was sending out. It was 9.15 a.m. when I got back to room 45. Burglary. I sat down at a table in the squad room and I started to address the cards when Frank walked in carrying a stack of Christmas boxes. Hi, Joe. All right. Christmas cards, huh? A little late, aren't you? Well, I was going to send them out Monday, but we had that stake out. You ought to get married, Joe. Yeah? It's the only system. Faye does all that stuff for me. Laundry, mails, cards. Only system. Might help. I brought in your present. Want to open it now? No, I'll wait. I always open a couple of days before. Why? Well, it puts you in the spirit ahead of time. I opened Phil's this morning. Who's he? Faye's brother in Denver. Gave me a magazine. One of those funny ones. Oh, you mean a comic book? No. One of those funny ones, you know. No, I don't, Frank. Well, some of the pages have holes in them. You look through and there's a picture on the next page. Oh, yeah, I've seen those on the newsstand. They have cloth pasted in. Cloth? In the ads. If you want to buy a suit, they have a sample right there. You mean you can feel it? Reach right out and feel it. It was one for $200. A suit? Sure. Cloth comes from Scotland. What's it made out of, solid gold? No, they got a special kind of gold over there. It's real smooth. Not a goat, Frank. A sheep. Well, it's a special kind of sheep, then, because the suit costs $200. You gonna get one? I told Faye. She said, wear the sample. Anything doing? Fanning and Pryor were in on that market holdup. They come up with anything? Pound of air. Nothing else. I hope it stays quiet. I got more shopping to do. I finished. What'd you get, Ann? Stationary set. Some paper and envelopes. Leather binding. Joe, you'll never learn. Well, what's the matter? No woman wants a stationary set. Get her something personal. Well, it's got her initials on it. No, no. You want something more sentimental, romantic. What'd you get, Faye? It's different in her case. What'd you get, Faye? Sewing machine. That's romantic. Well, it isn't a way. Why don't you buy her a catcher's mitt? Gregory Friday. Yes, that's right. You have the right department. All right, Father, we'll be right down. No, you can tell us about it there. Goodbye. The old mission church, they've had a theft. Collection money? Statue of the child Jesus. Frank and I checked out of the office and rode over to the church at the corner of Sunset Boulevard in Maine. The old mission plaza church, founded 1781, the year Los Angeles became a Pueblo. The outside was typical early Spanish design, complete with mission arches. It was made of adobe and painted white. They called it the Queen of the Angels. The Padres from down in Mexico built it. The devout Mexicans in town still attended services there. 10.05 a.m. Frank and I crossed through the courtyard. It used to be the old stable, but the Spanish priest changed all that when it became a mission. Stonemasons paved the stable floor and made it a courtyard. They planted grapevines, trees, and flowers. A young priest crossed the courtyard to meet us. He'd been sitting on a stone bench reading his morning prayers, as priests had done here for 172 years. We asked for Father Xavier Rojas, who communicated with us. We were told he was inside. We entered a side door. The church seemed to glow with the hundreds of votive candles flickering on both sides of the altar and at the shrines throughout the church. It was empty except for a few people praying. Surrounding the main altar were several old oil paintings and gold frames. The air was heavy with the scent of Advent flowers. We found Father Rojas up near the sanctuary, looking at the nativity scene. He told us about the crib. It was a $70 duplication of the scene at Bethlehem. The parishioners had taken up a collection for it 31 years ago. It was put up every year on December 22nd and taken down after the holy season. It was beautiful, except that one of the shepherds had lost an arm, the sheep was old and cracked, and the infant Jesus was missing. Father Rojas led us back into the sacristy. I'm sorry to bother you, man. All right, Father. Especially now, the holiday season. We cash our checks, Father. You want to tell us what happened? Or what you think happened? I discovered the statue was missing right after the six o'clock mass. You say for six? Yes. I started over to the rectory and stopped by the crib. Was the statue there before mass? I don't know. But it was there last night. How late is the church open? All night. 
You leave it wide open so any thief can walk in? Particularly thieves, Sergeant. You say it was there last night, Father, how late? Ten or eleven o'clock, we had confessions. No one saw it after that? One of the altar boys, he says it may have been there. He thinks it was. Did he see it? He's not sure. What's his name? Pardon me. Here's the schedule. You'll find the names for every mass there. Was there a big crowd at the six o'clock mass, Father? Not too many. Seven's the big one. People on their way to work. Did anyone stay after mass, did you notice? Not especially. I came back here, took off the vestments. I suppose it was ten or fifteen minutes before I went back in the church. It was empty then? No, people were coming in for the seven o'clock. Are these the older boys, James Cornine and Joseph Heffernan? That's right. Joe's the one who mentioned it might have been there. Did you check with the other priests, Father? Before I called you. None of them knows anything about it. Just for a check on the pawn shops, how much is the statue worth? In money? Well, that's the point in pawn shops, Father. Only a few dollars. We could get a new one, but it wouldn't be the same. We've had children in the parish. They've grown up and married. It's the only Jesus they know. We understand. And we've had children who died. It was the only Jesus they knew. So many of the people who come here are simple people. They wouldn't understand, Sergeant. It would be like changing the evening star. We'll do our best, Father. That's why it would mean so much to have it back for the first mass on Christmas. It's not very long, Father. Less than 24 hours. If anything turns up here, you know where to get in touch with us. Yes. It's sad, isn't it? How's that? In so short a time, men learn to steal. Yes, but consider us, Father. Us? If some of them didn't, you and I'd be out of work. 10.50 a.m. We notified pawn shop detail. Frank and I checked out the two altar boys. The first one, James Cornine, said he knew nothing about the missing statue. The second one, Joseph Heffernan, was not at home. His father said he had a part-time job, but he'd have him get in touch with us right after lunch. By 11.30 a.m., we'd run out of book procedure. We had a man to find. Our only clue? He'd been to church. 11.33 a.m. We checked the phone books for the names of religious stores in the area. Two of them were closed. We tried the third. When we got there, the only person in the store was an elderly man sitting by a table. In front of him was a large, beautifully carved chess set. We're police officers. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Great to see you. Caught me in the middle of a big chess match. Where's your partner? Up in San Jose. We've been playing for years. Same match? No, just two or three months on this one. What I meant was we've been playing different matches for years. I see. You know, we do it through the mail. I send him a move, he sends me one. Must keep you on your toes. Except during the holidays, the mail gets all fiddled up. That's no good. Guess not. Slows things down, that's no good. I like to catch him off guard. You Mr. Flavin? How do you know? We never met. Your name's on the window out front. Mr. Flavin, we checked the other two religious stores in this neighborhood. They're closed. It's the best one anyway. Fifty percent European items. We're checking the stores around the mission church. For what? Statue of the child Jesus. Do you have one we could look at? Sure. No, sir, a larger one. You don't want a larger one, unless it's for a church. That's why you want a larger one. Could we see it, please? Not my due to butt in. But unless you live in a big place, this will make your living room all a kilter. Yes, sir. Do most of the people who go to the mission church trade here? Good many of them, especially the kids. Why kids? More religious. Check on yourself. See if kids aren't more religious than you. Might be so. That's what's wrong with the world. Oh, I don't mean you're wrong with it. Everybody. Yes, sir. What if we could stick to the point, Mr. Flavin? Sure. A lot of people from the mission church come in here. Do people ever come in and sell back a religious article? Like a prayer book or rosaries? Yes, sir. Second hand, you mean? Yes, sir. Not since I've ever been around. It's silly. Why? People don't have religious articles so they can get rid of them. They have them so they can have them. But if a man had a statue and wanted to sell it, he'd come to a place like this. Sure, but he wouldn't want to sell it. He would if it was stolen. No, sir. If a man was to steal a statue, he'd be crazy or something like that. The only place he'd want to go is where crazy people are. You may be right, Mr. Flynn. I don't know what you fellas are looking for, but if it's somebody who stole a statue, he's crazy and you won't find him. You won't find him as long as you live, or in a million years. That should cover it. We checked religious stores out as far as Van S. We asked the same questions. The owners gave us the same answers, but none of them were as encouraging as Mr. Flavin. Frank and I had lunch and reported back to the office. It was 1.30 p.m. when we started into the squad room. The captain was just coming out. I just checked for you in our lunchroom. And we've been out on that theft at the mission. 
May get some action on the Patterson case. They locate him? I think he's on the bus from Sacramento. Well, that means the Bakersfield police. We'll wait and see. One of you fellows, Sergeant Friday? He is. I'm Joe Heffernan. My father said you wanted to see me. Well, sit down, son. You didn't have to come in. A phone call would have worked. My father said to get on over. He says that any kid that uses phones is lazy. We want to ask you about this morning. You serve 6 o'clock mass? Yes, sir. I'm senior boy. So I get the 6. You're senior and you take the early trick? Yes, sir. That way, if you receive communion, you get to have breakfast sooner. Father Rojas says you think the statue was there before mass. I didn't look. But I have a feeling it was there. A feeling? You know, how you have a feeling about something, but you're not sure. Did you stay around long after Mass? I put out the candles and hung up my surplus. How long would that take? About five minutes, maybe. Did any of the people at Mass stay on? Some moms do, especially ladies. Oh? Maybe they don't finish in time, or else they start new prayers. I don't know. So when you left, there were still some women there? No, sir. That was at first. After I went back to the sacristy... There was only this one man. What man? He comes at 6 o'clock all the time. Do you know his name? No, sir. But he works down in Olive. You know, paint shop. Where the paint signs. Could you describe him? Sort of medium. Wearing a suit that didn't match. Didn't match? You know, different pants than coat. How about his age? Oh, he's pretty old. Take a guess. About 40, maybe. There's nothing particular about him. Then why'd you notice him? I've seen him before. In the bundle, I guess. The bundle? Out in front. I saw him when he was coming out. He had this bundle. And he almost dropped it. How large a bundle? It's hard to say. Come on, son. Was it large or small, the size of the statue? Not that big. Yes, sir. We located the sign shop. The suspect didn't work there anymore, but we discovered his name was Claude Stroop. We found out where he lived. 2.25 p.m., we arrived there. It was a hotel for men, mostly old men, mostly down and outers. It was called the Golden Dream. Police officers, we're looking for Claude Stroop. Hope Claude didn't get in any trouble. So do we, is he in? No. He's got room 307. You can check if you like. We'll take your word. Were you on this morning? Hmm? Yeah, the early shift. Well, we don't have shifts. My uncle owns the place. I'm the shift. Did Stroop spend last night here? Came in about 11. When did he leave this morning? Around 6, maybe before. Did he come back after? 8 o'clock or so. Then left. Supposed to be back at 10. Then pulls this trick. What trick? Our program. He knows the other fellas need him. Program? Yeah, here at the hotel. Every Christmas we have a program. Put up a tree and sing. They're mostly old fellas. Singing like that makes them remember back when they were kids. Then Jimmy Finn comes on. Jimmy Finn? He shares number 409. His family once had a lot of money, so he tells the fellas about it. Stories about Christmas. How they had this big log, and his grandfather used to start it up. And after dinner, everybody turned over his plate, and there underneath was a $20 gold piece. Brand new one. When Stroop came in this morning, did he have a bundle? I didn't see him come in. You said you saw him. I saw him go out after, but not come in. When was that? Eight. If you want to look for a bundle, I could give you his key. We don't have a warrant. It's all right. I know about police. It's all right with me. It's not with us. I didn't mean that. I just meant it was all right with me. Good on the feast of Stephen, when the They were three old men. We couldn't tell how much better they would have been with Stroop singing the fourth part, but somehow you didn't care. This was Christmas at the Golden Dream, and it sounded fine. Though the cross was cruel, when the poor man came in sight, carrying winter fuel. I got most of the songs down pat. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, that's why it's a shame Claude isn't here. He's tenor and they need him to make it sound just right. Does Stroop have a job? No, sir. He used to have jobs. Not much lately, though. Did he say where he was going? No, he should have. The fellas need him. When he comes in, will you call us? Sure, and uh, not say anything to him. That's right. I hope it's nothing serious for Claude. The fellas' troubles ought to be over. Troubles? Way back. It wouldn't count. Tell us anyway. Well, I don't know much about it. As much as you know. Now, come on. Was well, something back where he used to live. He robbed somebody or something. What else? That's all. It was a long time ago, way far back. But he forgot it all, the robbing and everything. No, not quite. Hmm? He remembered it this morning. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. For 
For Jesus Christ our Savior was born upon this day. Back to the office and ran Stroop's name through R and I. If he'd been booked anywhere, we had no record of it. At least not under that name. 4:15 p.m. Pawn shop detail reported back. No object resembling the statue of the child Jesus had been turned in. 4:18 p.m. I hung up the phone. Harrison's on that Sacramento bus. I thought Baker still had it. They were supposed to confirm. They did. Up the station. Well, what about Fanning and Pryor? They're still out. Well, they'll be back soon. When's the bus arrive? Six o'clock. Well, there's plenty of time for him to make it. There's more time for you. We're still in that theft. Can it wait? No. What is it? Ten, fifteen dollar statue? When's the price determine a case? I realize it's a church statue, but that doesn't give it priority. It's important to them, Captain. Joe and I promised to get it back. What do you got on it? Nothing much. And why are you so big hearted? Burglary Friday. When? No. Don't say anything. No. Right. It's Claude Stroop. He just walked into the hotel. He's our suspect. Nobody's late to him? No. You'll keep. You can run him down tomorrow. It'll be too late then. They need it for the first mass in the morning, Skipper. It's kind of a big thing for them. I'm sorry. I can't juggle details around so you get a statue back. If this time later on, we'll do our best. Yes, sir. You better get over to the station. Yes, sir. Will you call Father Rojas over at the mission? Why? Tell him we're too busy to work on that statue. Well, we'll do it later. Tomorrow or when we get a chance. Why can't you call him? Well, we better get over to the station. If Patterson's on that bus, we don't want to miss him. All right, I'll call him. Righty. Yeah. I can send Fanning and Priory. Might as well stand that other thing. Whatever you say, Captain. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. p.m. We arrived at the Golden Dream Hotel. The desk clerk was right. Claude Stroop looked like a man who had his troubles at bargain rates. Your name Claude Stroop? Yes, sir. Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. I didn't do anything against the law. Honest, I didn't do anything against it. You haven't been accused. I want to take you downtown. We'd like to talk to you. No, sir, I'm not going. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to talk to anybody. You're half wrong already. Fifteen p.m. We returned Stroop for interrogation. He kept his word. He refused to talk. 6.05 p.m. Frank called Faye, told her he'd be a little late. Stroop didn't move for a whole hour. He sat and stared, but he didn't talk. 6.40 p.m. We got a final report from pawn shop detail. The shops were closed. There was no statue. Stroop still hadn't talked. Don't you ever want to go home, Stroop? If I was to talk, he wouldn't let me go. Depends on what you'd say. I'd say it wrong, and I wouldn't get home. You won't this way either. I'd like to go. You can bet on that. This is the seventh year we had the program, and I never missed a one. Not a single one. Why don't you tell us what happened, Stu? How would I know you'd let me go? You wouldn't. I might as well anyway. All right, what happened from mass on? Well, there was mass. I came out and started down toward the hotel. Back up. I left my stuff at the hotel, and then I picked up George's car. I didn't steal it. He said I could have it any time I wanted. Only this time I didn't ask him. I took it and started out. Well, I should have asked, but I just didn't. I went over to Grand Avenue for the Christmas bulbs where this fellow sells in second hand. It was coming out of the lot, but I did. Yeah. The bumper must have caught the other car. Didn't leave too big a dent, but there was this long scratch. I got out and tried to wipe it off with my handkerchief. You know, spit on it like. Oh, it didn't do no good. I didn't think anybody saw. I don't know how you fellows found out about it. I'll check auto records. Right. Stroop, we didn't bring you down here to talk about that. You didn't? No. There's a statue missing from the church. A statue of the child Jesus. You mean I took it? You took a bundle out of church. Yes, sir. That was my other pants for the program tonight. I had a place sewed up and there was a button on it. You can check. But I wouldn't take a statue. I don't think you would either. He's clear at auto records. One hope. For the program? You mean it's all right? Good night, Stu. Good night. Merry 
Merry Christmas. Where to? Well, I don't know. We could stay and work on it tonight. Wouldn't do any good. We won't find it. I don't think so. No use kidding the priest. Build his hopes up. Might as well go tell him now. Seven twenty-seven p.m. We found Father Rojas. Frank told him how it was that we couldn't get the statue back by morning, but that we'd keep trying during the week. He said he understood. We told him we had to get on. As Frank and I started to leave, the doors at the main entrance to the church opened. It was a good two hundred feet away. It was hard to be sure, but it looked like a small boy drawing a bright red wagon behind him. When he got closer, you could see he was no bigger than a pint of milk. He was a luminous-eyed little Mexican boy with a face as young as yesterday. The priest seemed to know him. Paquito? In the back of the wagon was the missing statue of the child Jesus. He picked it up gently and walked up to the priest. Padre Rojas? He just stood there looking up at Father Rojas. Paco Mendoza, the boy from the parish. Ask him where he found it. Donde lo encontraste? No lo encontré. Lo cogí esta mañana. He didn't find it. He took it. Why? Por qué? Todos los años Paquito rezó por un camisito rojo. Este año Paquito rezó al niño Jesús. Yo prometí al niño Jesús el primer viaje en mi camioncito. He says all through the years he's prayed for a red wagon. This year he prayed to the child Jesus. He promised that if he got the wagon, the child Jesus would have the first ride in it. He wants to know if the devil will come and take him to hell. That's your department, Father. No, el diablo. Jesus ama a Paquito mucho. We crossed over to the sanctuary. With the help of Father Rojas, the young boy replaced the infant Jesus in its rightful place, the crib in the nativity scene. Frank and I could have been wrong, but the small plaster statue seemed to approve. Mary, Joseph, the wise men, Gaspar, Melchior, Balthazar, the old shepherd, the young shepherd, the peasant, they all seemed to approve. Vuelve a tu casa, Paquito. The priest told the boy to go home. He took hold of his wagon and started the long walk out of the church. There wasn't much we could say. There wasn't much to say. We just stood there and watched him go. Halfway up, he turned to look back. And he went on out. I don't understand how he got that wagon today. Don't kids wait for Santa Claus anymore? It isn't from Santa Claus. The firemen fix old toys and give them to new children. Paquito's family, they're poor.
story you have just heard is true. The names and locations were changed. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Dr. Kildare. Whatsoever house I enter, there will I go for the benefit of the sick. And whatsoever things I see or hear concerning the life of men, I will keep silence thereon, counting such things to be held as sacred trust. I will exercise my art solely for the cure of my... The story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer brought you those famous motion pictures. Now this exciting, heartwarming series is heard on radio. In just a moment, the story of Dr. Kildare. But first, your announcer. See me, Dr. Le- oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were alone. It's all right, Jim. Come in. Come in. Uh, Mr. Sarvo, this is Dr. Kildare. Dr. Kildare? How do you do, sir? Jimmy, Mr. Sarvo has presented me with a problem, and I wanted you here as a witness. Oh? Mr. Sarvo wants me to examine a man and treat him, but he wants me to do it without knowing the identity of the patient. Nobody can know his identity. That is imperative. <laughs> It's also highly unusual, Mr. Sargo. I assure you it is necessary. It's also necessary that I protect Blair Hospital. I don't understand. Oh, that should be rather simple to understand, Mr. Sargo. For all Dr. Gillespie knows, you may be asking him to treat a criminal or something. A man wanted by the law. No, I give you my word. The man you will treat is not a criminal. Quite the contrary. Well, then why can't you tell me who he is? Dr. Gillespie, I can't even give you a reason. All I can say is that I hope someday I may be able to explain it to you. Ah. Oh, there's one thing we're entitled to know. You uh, didn't choose Blair Hospital and Dr. Gillespie out of thin air for this case. The choice was made after extensive inquiry. Dr. Gillespie is reputed to be the finest internist available. Hmm. How do you know your patient needs an internist? Because of the symptoms. Severe abdominal pain, general malaise, insomnia. Doctor, it is my understanding that you cannot refuse to treat a patient simply because you do not know his identity. Oh, just a moment, Mr. Sargo. Dr. Gillespie hasn't refused treatment. Then there's nothing further to discuss, is there? I will reserve two rooms here at the hospital for tomorrow morning. I'll occupy one of them so that I may be close at hand. And your patient will be admitted to the other under the name of John Smith. John Smith. <laughs> All right. Bring him in the morning and we'll have a look at him. Thank you, gentlemen. I wish I could tell you what a tremendous trust is being placed in your hands. Oh, just a moment, Mr. Sarvo. Uh, Dr. Gillespie, uh, according to the symptoms, we probably should run a GI series. Huh? patient might as well be prepared for it anyway when he comes in. Huh? Yes, 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 of course, Jimmy, that's right. Uh, see that your uh, John Smith takes no food or liquid of any kind after midnight tonight. Have him here and ready for examination at 8 o'clock in the morning. Any request you make will be granted, Doctor. Yeah. Any request will be granted, Doctor. Except telling us who the patient really is. Someday, frustration of your curiosity will give you an ulcer. Oh, is that so? <laughs> when did I ever go around sticking my nose into other people's business? I... What was that noise? 
that I know. Uh, since when have you taken over the janitor's job? You were listening at the keyhole. That's what you were doing. Oh, I was not. No, you were so. You're just busting to find out who John Smith is. Why, I... Ah, oh, go on. Go back to your work and stop meddling. Well, you don't have to go hollering just because I'm interested in my job, you know. <laughs> Women. Did you ever see anybody so nosy in all your life, Jimmy? Ah, oh, that's a delicate question. Well, if a man wants to call himself John Smith, it's nobody's business but his own. Oh, I quite agree. <laughs> Who the devil can he be picking such a silly name like that? Oh, we may find out in the morning while we're finding out what's wrong with him. Now, don't be nervous, Mr. Smith. Horoscope can't harm you. Boy... It just makes it possible for us to see how you're functioning organically. I quite understand. I, uh, <laughs> I won't be a difficult patient. Oh, I'm sure you won't. Uh, heart looks all right. Uh, move the viewing plate down, Jimmy. Okay. Get a look at the, uh... Hmm. Look at this, Dr. Gillespie. I see it. Uh, in the pyloric region. Uh, have you had difficulty retaining food lately, Mr. Smith? Yes. Sometimes I suffer from uh, extreme nausea. Uh, better get a better look at that, Jimmy. Parker, uh, where's the barium mixture? Uh, right here, Dr. Gillespie. Give it to Dr. Kildare. Thank you. Oh, uh, Mr. Smith, I want you to take this glass in your left hand. Got it? Yes. Now, this is barium. It's a metallic liquid. Harmless, but it shows up well in the fluoroscope and x-ray. We can trace its course through your digestive tract. I want you to start by taking just one large swallow. All right, doctor. That's good, good. Now, just hold the glass. I want you to drink the rest of it in a minute. Uh, use a little hand pressure, Jimmy. All right. Force it around the pyloric region. Let me know if this causes you any discomfort, Mr. Smith. Mm. See it clearly now? Yeah, very clearly. All right, Mr. Smith, drink the rest of the mixture. Pay it all down quickly as possible, please. Now, I'll tilt the backboard into table position. I want you to climb up on it and lie down on your stomach. That's it. Now, lie on your right side of your face. Arms above your head, please. I'll move the view plate, Jimmy. Thanks. Hey, there it is. That's the spot. Yes. Hmm. All right, Parker, turn off the fluoroscope, put on the lights. You just stay in that same position for a few minutes, Mr. Smith. All right. Want me to call the x-ray technician? Yeah, yeah. Tell them to take four-quarter views and, and let's know when they're ready. After the x-rays are finished, you can go back to your room, Mr. Smith. We'll talk to you later. Thank you, Doctor. Hmm. Well, what do you think, Jimmy? We'll know better when we see the x-rays, of course, but there's a definite growth on the pylorus. A dangerous growth. Not necessarily, not unless it's malignant. Well, if it isn't now, it will be if it's left there much longer. I'd recommend exploratory surgery unless the plates indicate a benevolent tumor. I am afraid that what we saw wasn't benevolent. Here are the x-rays, Dr. Gillespie. Huh? Oh, good. Let's have a look at them. I'm afraid they don't require very much looking. Yeah. You agree? All the appearances of carcinoma. That's what I thought. A little have to be removed. Uh, and in a couple of weeks at the most. If the growth spreads, the pylorus will be completely obstructed. After that, we'd be too late. Well, we don't have any worry on that score. Mm. It isn't too late now, from all indications. It's still operable, and I'd say the prognosis is favorable. Oh, definitely. Uh, unless complications develop. Mm. None manifest. Well, serious complications seldom are. They pop up when they're least expected. That's what makes them serious. Guess we'd better have a talk with Smith and get his consent for surgery. Uh, Mr. Sabo has asked that we discuss our findings with him first, Jimmy. He's been in my outer office for an hour. You know, that's an odd relationship between Sarvo and Smith. Yeah. What do you suppose is behind it? Well, well, Dr. Kildare, 
Who's busting with curiosity now? Oh, come now, Dr. G. Your long nose is still showing. It is not. Parker! Parker! Yes, Dr. Gillespie? Is Mr. Sarvo still there? Yes, Mr. Yes. Send him in, please. Doctor, we'll see you now, Mr. Sarvo. Thank you. Oh, gentlemen, he's all right, isn't he? There, there's nothing seriously wrong. Are you asking us or telling us? Well, I'm sorry, Doctor. I'm upset. Now, please, please tell me what you found. Your friend's a very sick man, Mr. Sarvo. I'll be blunt with you. We've located what seems to be a cancerous growth. Then he's going to die. Nobody said that. Well, fortunately, you brought him here in time. The growth is operable. No, Doctor. You're wrong. Hmm? The growth is not operable. Not with him. Are you a doctor, Mr. Sarvo? No, but I know something that you have yet to learn. Then you'll understand. I'll begin by telling you who John Smith really is. Well? The man you know as John Smith is Philip III, King of Corsonia. Oh, of Corsonia. that's impossible. Philip of Corsonia abdicated his throne, made the country a democracy 15 years ago. He's been living in England. He has been here incognito for several months. Why couldn't you tell us this before? Because he has enemies. In four months, there will be a plebiscite in Corsonia, an election that will determine whether the country remains democratic or falls before a rising dictatorship. Philip is the one man who can rally the democratic forces, bring the split factions together. Well, then the operation is even more imperative. If we don't operate, he'll be dead in two months. I know, Doctor. But there's nothing you can do to save him. But we told you that the whole... Just a minute, Jimmy, just a minute. I'm afraid we're dealing with more than cancer. We're dealing with the curse of royal blood. Uh, is Philip a descendant of the Bourbon Savo? Yes. Yes. You mean he's a hemophiliac, a bleeder? Yes, Doctor. <sighs> what can we do, Dr. Gillespie? If we don't operate on him, he'll die of cancer in two months. If we do operate, his blood won't coagulate. He'll bleed to death on the table. Jimmy, that man is doomed. <laughs> We return to the story of Dr. Kildare in just a moment. Come in here to read me the Constitution? I am speaking of my rights in this hospital. Oh. Why haven't I been informed that Blair Hospital is honored by the presence of His Royal Majesty, Philip III of Corsonia? What? Carew. How in tarnation did you find that out? That man's here incognito. You understand? I understand that you have tried to deprive Blair Hospital of the greatest publicity story in its history. Publicity. If one word of this leaks out, I'll cut out your giblets. But really, you expect me to ignore... How did you find out? I have my sources of information, Dr. Oh, 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 so that's it. Parker! Did you call me your magic... Uh, oh, I mean, uh, the Dr. Gordon? You nitwit. So that's why you've been practicing that funny bowing stuff. Well, for your information, it's not funny bowing stuff. It's but what they do at court, and it's called a curtsy. Curtsy. A curtsy. With those pretzel legs of yours. Pretzel legs? Let me tell you. You tell me nothing, nothing. I'll tell you, both of you. 
A man is going to die and the country he loves may die with him. Is that what you two blabbermouths want to turn into a publicity circus? Get out of here! Kildare, I mean... How are you today, Mr... No. <laughs> I gave up being a king 15 years ago. Call me Philip, please. And, and... Regard me as a friend. Oh, thank you. Savo tells me that I have two months, Doctor. Oh, of course, we can never be certain about no, those. No, no, It's all right. I, I had hoped it might be longer, I not for myself, but, but for my people. If only I could live until the plebiscite. To see them secure with an honorable government, I... I would do anything. Would you gamble on losing the two months you do have to live? Uh, would you take that chance? Why do you ask, Dr. Kildare? Because even with the odds of thousand to one against us, I'm going to ask you to risk that operation. But with hemophilia... If... Just a moment, Savo. Go ahead, Dr. Kildare. Well, when a hemophiliac lives to maturity, as you have, there's sometimes an improvement in the condition of his blood. Not much, but some. With a strict pre-surgical regime, we might make some slight additional improvement. Maybe enough to give us just the ghost of a chance. How can you ask him to take this risk? You're forgetting something, Savo. I am going to die in any case. Dr. Kildare is asking me to risk what time I have left against... The faint hope of recovery, and with it, life for our people. I'm sorry, Philip. I withdraw my objection. All right, Doctor. I'll gamble with you. But do you realize you are gambling, too? I realize that very keenly. Well, then why are you doing this, Doctor? I have my reasons. Very well. When will you uh, operate? In about two weeks, when we've prepared you as best we can, I'll start by having the nurse bring you a capsule. It's uh, an ovarian extract. You ought to have one every three hours around the clock from now until surgery. The other preparations, well, you'll be acquainted with them as we go along. Send for me, Dr. Gillespie? You know, Don, well, I did. Sit down, Jimmy. Sit down. What are you up to? Why, I don't know what you mean. Do you think I'm deaf, dumb, blind? What's behind those uh, extracts you've been prescribing for Philip? Well, Dr. Gillespie, I, I've started him on a pre-surgery regime. A pre-surgery? Jimmy killed there. Have you gone mad? You've got to try it. Have you thought of what failure means? The life of one man who will die anyhow. Oh, I know that. But the world won't know about it or about the odds against you. They'll only know that a king died under your scalpel. And your future as a doctor will die with him. I can't let that matter. Not in the face of what it means to his country. Or what it may mean to the rest of the world. What does it mean to us? If Philip lives, it guarantees a democracy in Corsonia. A friendly nation in the strategic heart of Europe. Something to help balance our world against everything that might try to destroy it. And does my reputation mean more than that? Uh, well, you're right, Jimmy. We've no choice. Let's have it. What are you planning? Oh, well, now, Dr. Gillespie, I can't ask you to share this. Oh, confound it, Jimmy Kildare. Don't you try pulling that on me. I brought you into this case, and we'll see it through together. <laughs> Now, if we can get a look at this blood smear under the microscope. He did a lot of bleeding for a simple finger punch. I know, I know. How does that slide look? The platelet counts all right. Let's see, above 250,000, but hmm. there's still a qualitative defect. That's the trouble. It won't clot. Type AB. We'll call a donor. <laughs> All set for direct transfusion, Dr. Kildare. Thanks, Parker. Now, uh, you may bleed quite a bit, sir. I understand. 
Clench and unclench your fist after I enter the vein. Here we go. Hey, watch the point of entry, Jimmy. It's all right. He'll get more than he loses. Yeah, not as much as you'll need. Mm, plate looks look a little better, Dr. G. Uh, clotting time didn't. It still took too long. Well, we'll have to give him another direct transfusion in surgery. Parker, prepare an injection of fresh serum. 30 cc's. Intramuscular? Yes, Parker, but I'll administer it. I better repeat the same injection 24 hours before surgery. I will. But that'll be it, Dr. Gillespie. There's nothing else we can do. Yes, there is, Jimmy. Yes, there is. Give it up. I can't. I've given my word. Win or lose. Parker, see that the operating room is ready Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock. Scalpel, Parker. Yes, Doctor. How are those hemo clamps, Dr. Gillespie? All right. Jimmy, but you hurry, hurry up. No time for pathology. We've got to get out fast. Open the transfusion valve a little more, Parker. He isn't getting it fast enough. Hmm. Carcinoma isn't too bad. I'll be finished in a minute. Oh, the cancer isn't our worry. Dr. Kildare. What is it, Dr. Mason? I'm not getting a pulse, Doctor. I can't stop quickly, Parker. Coramine hypo. Here. I'll tell you. Right into the heart muscle, Dr. Gillespie. Huh? There it is, Jimmy. Well, I've got all of the growth ready for suturing. Any response, Dr. Mason? No, I do Wait a minute. Yes. Faint, but there's a pulse. Step up the oxygen, please. Watch those hemo clamps, Jimmy. I am, but we've got to close him up fast. Can't take much more blood from the donor. Pulse is holding eagerly, Doctor, but still faint. We'll make it. We'll get him out alive, and we've got to keep him that way. <laughs> That's a tough one, Jimmy. Yeah. Get those ice packs ready, Parker. Temperature change around the incision may help clotting. How about cannon applications? Try it, try it. We'll try anything now. We've got nothing to lose. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, Dr. G. How is he? Oh, I... I'm afraid. I'm afraid we've lost. See for yourself. But, Jimmy, there's no excessive blood loss here. Clotting seems to be all right. All right, but too late. Jimmy, come over here. Is he gone? Gone, nothing. Well, what was his last temperature reading? Very low, almost down to 96. Well, it's better than that now. You can tell by a feeling. Get those ice patches off him right away. He does seem to be warmer. Ah, of course he's warmer. He's not in coma. He's in shock from loss of blood. But he's holding now. Uh, let his temperature come up. The clotting is strong enough to hold. If he's watched every minute to keep him from moving. Once he comes out of shock, one more transfusion would get him over the hump. Yes, unless... Unless we've failed where we can't see our failure. Inside, there may be internal loss. You but know. there is, he won't regain consciousness. There is. It'll be my fault. Don't ever say that, Jimmy. Getting him this far is a miracle... You had to work faster than any surgeon I've ever seen. I mean, against fantastic odds. He's stirring. He's coming around. Talk to him. Penetrate his consciousness. I'll try. Philip. Uh, Philip. Uh, Philip, do you hear me, Philip? The Dr. Gilbert. He's coming through, Jimmy. Yes. Yeah. Finished? Yes, Philip, we're finished. It's all over. You'll be all right now. Ah. Uh. Faith in you. You couldn't have had faith in a better man. Jimmy, I'm going to call the donor. Oh, I'll do it, Doctor. No, 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 no. You stay here with your patient. I'm the assistant on this case, and I'm proud of it. In just a moment, we will return to the story of Dr. Kildare.
now, once again, the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Good morning, Dr. G. Well, Jimmy, why are you so bright and cheerful? Why haven't you seen the morning papers? Look. Hey, look. Results of the Corsonia plebiscite. Look at that headline. Uh, former monarch leads Democratic faction to overwhelming victory. Mm-hmm. People rally to execute. Jimmy, that is wonderful. I know, and look at this. The man we knew as Sarvo was elected president of the Republic. Ah, president. I like that word, Jimmy. I like it. Give me a safe Dr. Kildare, oh, Dr. Kildare. Yes, Parker, must you come in here like you were shot out of a cannon? Well, I wanted to give this to Dr. Kildare. It's a cablegram. It just came all the way from Europe. From Europe? Here. What is it? What does it say? Oh, well, I'll give him a chance to open it. Do you think he has x-ray eyes? Good. Well, Jimmy, what does it say? Mm, it's from Philip. It says... President Sarvo and I thank you for a victory that would not have been possible without your help and the help of Dr. Gillespie. <laughs> and persuading Sarvo to appoint me ambassador to the United States and look forward to seeing you again. <laughs> Sarvo and I pledge that you and your country will always have friends in ours. With humble gratitude. have just heard the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. This program was written by Joel Murcott and directed by Joe Bigelow. Original music was composed and conducted by Walter Schumann. Virginia Gregg was heard as Nurse Parker and Ted Osborne as Dr. Carew. Others in the cast included Larry Dobkin and Ben Wright. Dick Joy speaking. Came in, hung up my hat, and sat down at the desk. Yeah. Wouldn't have noticed anything was wrong, but I promised my wife I'd type her jingle first thing when I got here. What's that? A jingle. Wife works all the contests and papers, magazines, you know. Oh, yeah. She writes them in longhand, then I have to type them. Uh-huh. That takes up my time, but it makes her happy and keeps peace in the family. Yeah, you want to go on? I sat down at the desk. Open the door on this side. See? Yeah. Reached in to pull the typewriter up into position. No typewriter. It was gone, huh? Yeah. Knew something was wrong. I'd used it yesterday just before I locked up the place. I see. I looked around to see if anything else was missing. The adding machine and my desk fountain pen are gone, too. Now, how about the outside? Are there any cars missing? Yeah. One. A 1953 Dodge. I was saving the real bad news to last. 
All right, we'll need a description, the color, the model, the engine number. Mm-hmm. I knew you'd want it. Got it all right here on this card. Here you go. Okay. Better call this in, huh? Yeah. Uh, Late in Princeton Lab, too. Right. You can use either phone. Thank you. Can you give us the serial numbers on the typewriter and the adding machine? Have to talk to Mabel first. She has them filed someplace. That's your secretary? Yeah. Mr. Day on. Well, now, as far as you know, then, you've told us about everything that was taken. Yeah. Were these windows locked when you came in? Yeah. I never open them. Don't have to. Place is air-conditioned. Uh-huh. You say the front door was locked, huh? Yeah. Extra keys gone from the board, though. Well, this will be right out there. All right. What were you saying about those keys? Want to step over here? I'll show you. Now, these are the keys for the cars on the lots. All labeled. Here's where the keys for the Dodge were. Mm-hmm. Now, this hook had the extra key for the front door. Mm-hmm. Binion, how many keys are there for the office? Three. I have one. Mabel has one. The other one was on the board. How long has she worked for you? Mabel? That's right. About eight years. If you think she had anything to do with this, forget it. I'd as soon accuse my own wife. I didn't understand it, Binion. We'll have to talk to her. All right. I'll call Mabel and have her come down. We'd appreciate that. I know she didn't have anything to do with this. I'll give you odds on that. Anyway, I've read in the papers recently where there have been other burglaries like this. Yeah. My money says it's somebody with experience. Maybe. You must have some idea who's doing it. Well, we're working on it. In other words, you don't have us to go on. Not a lot. Mm-hmm. Doesn't sound too good for me. I mean, my chances of getting my property back. We'll do what we can, sir. I know, but if you don't have any leads, if they don't make any mistakes, there's much you can do, is there? Seems to me the thieves always have the edge. Yeah, it begins that way. Hmm? They always start before we do. Crews from the crime lab and Leighton Prince went over to the office. John Binion's secretary came in, but after questioning her, we decided she had nothing to do with the crime. She went through her desk and told us that a check made out to her employer was missing. Binion called his bank and then promised to notify him if the check was cashed and returned to them. We got the serial numbers on the adding machine and the typewriter and we notified pawn shop detail. Bulletins were also sent to second-hand stores. The latest burglary was similar to others that we'd been investigating. The thief's M.O. was no different than we had on file and to date we had been unable to make any recoveries. We talked to informants, but they could give us no leads to the identity of the burglar. The report from the crime lab was the same as on all the other thefts. Entry had been made through the door. The lock had not been forced, indicating either the use of a key or some instrument to pick the lock. Leighton Prince failed to find any usable fingerprint. Tuesday, July 14th, 10.31 a.m. I got it. Burglary Friday. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. With your name? You have it now? All right, we'll be right out. Right, bye. It was Binion. He called from his bank. Yeah? I think he turned to lead. What do you mean? Stolen check was cashed. When we got to John Binion's office, he showed us the check. We compared the endorsement with his signature, and it proved to be a good forgery. The check had been cashed by a Sylvia Carnes. Frank and I drove to the address, a small bookstore at the corner of Citrus Avenue and Hollywood Boulevard. Miss Carnes was shown the check, and we asked if she remembered who'd given it to her. Let me think now. John Binion. Not too good on people's names. Let me check the sales slips for that day. I should have a record of what he bought. Excuse me, Miss I forget names, but when I look at the books they buy, most of the time I can remember the person. Mm hmm. Yeah, here they are. You always write the name on cash sales? Yes, it's a good way to build a mailing list. Mm hmm. Here it is. John Binion on the 8th. Let's see. Mm hmm. Well, can you remember anything about the man? I might. May I have to slip, Mr. Freddy? Here you are. Hmm. Some blackboard, the back bay. Oh, yes. This is by a country school teacher. Gave up the little red school house to become a private tutor. Tells about some of his problems and how he dealt with them. It's quite amusing. Yes, ma'am. But does it remind you of anything about the man? No. Well, let's see what else he bought. Locks down through the ages. I never read that one. I guess it's about locks. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm beginning to remember. Yes, ma'am. He said locks were a hobby with him. Does that mean anything to you? Yes, Mike, but can you tell us anything about the man's looks? Well, I'll see. I guess he was about your size. Me, ma'am? No, he wasn't quite as... Well, he looked more like Mr. Friday. Yeah. How about his coloring? He had dark hair. Straight. Mm-hmm. Do they have any marks on his face that we might use to identify him? 
Not that I recall. Could you tell us anything about how he was dressed? I'm afraid not. Other book was The Window Without Curtains. Mm-hmm. Now, that reminds me of something. What's that? His voice. Yeah. He's almost too precise, too perfect. Did you notice any accent? No. Is there anything else you can tell us about his looks? Mm, no. What kind of identification did he show you? A driver's license. And it was made out to John Binion? I tried. I copied the name to see a slip from it. That's the only identification he showed you? Yes, I didn't ask for any more. He seemed to know a lot of the business people in this neighborhood. No. Mentioned them by name, said he lived near here before he got married. I see. No, I've been in business for six years. This is my first loss on the check. That right. I've always been so careful. This man, though, he seems so honest, so polite. Mm-hmm. He's sure rough on me. I have to suffer the loss. The check was for $30. He only bought $10 worth of books. I gave him $20 of my own money. It's a real loss, I can tell you. Well, yes, ma'am. There's one thing in your favor. What's that? He's going to feel it more than you will. <laughs> From what Sylvia Carnes told us, we knew that our suspect was also a forgery artist or he had connections that could furnish him with suitable identification. Assuming the suspect might still live in the neighborhood, we spent the rest of the day questioning people in the area. We failed to come up with any leads. The next day, we started the canvas again. The manager of a small hotel told us that a man named Paul DeRoe was living there who could fit the partial description we had. In the manager's company, we went upstairs to look through the room. Hey, Joe. Yeah. Picture on the wall, some kind of certificate, too. Looks like it's written in German. Want to take a look? Well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That looks like Dutch to me. You see there? Guy's wearing a 45. Looks like he's carrying an American carbine. He's not wearing any kind of a uniform. Hmm. Well, what are you trying to prove? Certificate probably says what it's for, huh? Yeah, maybe. Let's find out if this is the row in this picture here. Mr. Bleeker, will you take a look at this and tell us if it's the row? Yeah, sure. What do you say? Uh, he's younger here, but I'd say it's him. All right, thank you. Frank? Just a minute, Joe. Better see if Miss Carnes can make an identification from this picture. Yeah, take a look at this. Just turned it. Mm-hmm. Found it up there on the shelf, wrapped in an oil skin tobacco pouch. Yeah. Torsion bars, vibrator, ballpoint pick. It works. Looks like good steel, too, doesn't it? Well, guess we got the right room. Unless they all come with burger kits. Frank and I continued to search the room. Besides the burger kit, we found three books with the same titles as those bought with a stolen check. Sylvia Carnes identified the picture as being the same man that had passed the check. We called the office and asked them to run the name and description of Paul DeRoe through R and I. A local and an APB were gotten out on the suspect. Frank and I went back to the hotel and decided because of the physical setup of the lobby, it would be better to wait in the suspect's room. The manager took over the desk and we arranged for him to notify us with one long ring on the phone when Duro asked for his key. Three hours went by. 9.13 p.m. That's it. Yeah. All right, hold it right there. Oh. Get the light, Frank. Yeah. Who are you? Police officers. What are you doing here? You're police, eh? That's right. Who are you? Paul sent me up here. Paul DeRoe? That's right. And where's he now? Why do you want to know? Come on, lady. Where is he? Waiting for me. Where? Outside in the car. Is he still waiting? I don't know. What do you mean? Well, he left me off at the door. There wasn't any place to park. All right, go ahead. He was going to drive around the block and pick me up. What kind of a car is he driving? Well, I'm not sure. You rode in it, didn't you? Yes. Well, don't you know what kind it is? I didn't pay any attention. Well, what do you mean? Well, he drives so many different kinds. girl, Darlene Potter, with us, and we went down to the lobby. She was instructed to go out to the street and meet Duro. Frank and I followed her. There was no car waiting outside the hotel. On the chance that he might have parked and was waiting for the girl, Frank went up the street and then crossed to the other side. I walked down the street toward our car. Duro failed to show up. We went back to the hotel and asked the manager to call us if the suspect returned, and then we took the girl down to the city hall. During the trip, she maintained she didn't know what make car he was driving. She said he told her that he was an automobile salesman, that he also worked as a private teacher. We ran her name through R&I, but we found no record. 
The run on the name Paul DeRoe had failed to turn a package. Leighton French was requested to go over to Rowe's room, 10.02 p.m. We continued to interrogate Darlene Potter. How long have you known DeRoe? I told you before, three months. Who did he say he worked for? He never said. Where did he teach? Private homes. Can he give us their names? No, I can't tell you. You don't know? That's right. He just said he taught. Never said where. What did he teach? Language. What language? French, I think. You haven't told me what this is all about, but I'm sure there's a mistake. Paul wouldn't have to do anything wrong. Why do you say that? He's too intelligent. Well, it doesn't look that way right now, does it? Paul's a hero. What else do you know about him? What? His background. Where's he from? I'm not sure. I I think he said something once about going to school in Paris. Is he an American citizen? I just assumed he was. He never said anything different. Uh Uh-huh. Can't you tell me what he's done? We'd like to talk to him about some burglaries and some car thefts. Paul wouldn't steal. Well, maybe so, ma'am. We've got good reason to think he did. Well, there's some mistake. It doesn't fit with the kind of person he is. How do you mean that? It might not make much sense to you. Well, give us a try. Paul was in the war. And so? Yes, maybe you saw the picture and citation in his room. Yeah, we did. What about it? He fought with the Dutch underground forces. He told you that, did he? Yes. He only talked about it once or twice. I think he was in that group. I, I don't remember the name, but they went in and organized the resistance forces before the invasion. Uh-huh. You're pretty sure Paul is the man you want? Looks that way, yes, ma'am. It's hard to believe. But there's a reason for it. I guess he took a lot of chances during the war. Must have changed him. He hasn't changed. Further interrogation of Darlene Potter convinced us that she knew the suspect only as a friend. When we drove her home, she gave us a more recent snapshot of DeRoe. The next day, copies were made and distributed to radio patrol units. Frank and I went back to the hotel to make another check of the room to try and find something that might lead us to any of his friends or associates. We found a list of names and addresses under a desk blotter. The first four people that we talked to all told us the same thing. They said that the man known as Paul DeRoe was a private tutor for their children. The only address that any of them had for him was the hotel. At two of the homes, we were told he came to teach on Wednesdays. One party said he came on Saturdays, and the other one said he came on Tuesdays. 4.03 p.m. We identified ourselves and were admitted to a home on Chatham Drive by a Mrs. Grace Findlay. Won't you gentlemen be seated? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Oh. What was it you wanted to see me about? Well, Miss Findlay, we'd like you to look at this picture and tell us if you recognize this man. There you are. Certainly. Why, yes, that's Paul DeRoe. wonder if you'd mind telling us what you know about him. Well, I'm not sure I understand just what you mean. Well, is he a friend of the family? Yes, in a way. He's the children's French teacher. Uh-huh. He's not in trouble with the police, is he? We'd like to talk to him. I hope it isn't serious. Well, it might be, Miss Finley. Serious enough to have him put in jail? Might be. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. He's been so wonderful with the children. Mm -hmm. He's the third teacher we've had. Somehow they never liked the others, but they're just crazy about Paul. You're certain he's done something wrong? We'd like to find him and get his side of the story. Now, do you have a home address for him? Yes. Does he know you're looking for him? We wouldn't know that, ma'am. Strange. How's that? Well, I was thinking if you're looking for him and he knows it, it's odd he'd call here today. Did you talk to him today? Yes. Thursday to give the children their instructions. Yes, ma'am. He said he'd be here at 5 o'clock. With Mrs. Findlay's permission, Frank drove our car into the garage and then we waited for Duro to arrive. While we were waiting, Mrs. Findlay told us that when DeRoe had applied for the job, he'd showed her several letters of recommendation from families in the East. Because of his intelligence and her children's instant liking for him, she hadn't made a check on his background. She went on to say that she had noticed him driving several different makes of cars, but she couldn't give us a description of any of them. 5.06 p.m., the front doorbell rang. That must be him. I hope there's no trouble. All right, you wait here, Miss Findlay. All right. Don't worry about it. Right, hold it right there, Darrell, police officer. This is hardly the reception expected. Right, move over. Put both hands up against the door. Come on, move. We use the same method. Frank. Yeah, he's clean, sir. I could have told you, gentlemen, that I'm not in the habit of coming to a client's home carrying a gun. I right, turn around. Get a chance behind your back. Couldn't we dispense with the handcuffs? This is rather embarrassing. Well, you'll get used to it. I was thinking about the children. I don't want them to see me like this. You should have thought about that sooner. Better get the car, huh? Right. I imagine this is about the check I cashed. A few other things. 
I worked with the Americans during the war. That's all? I learned a good many things about them. Very resourceful, brilliant, and eager to help the less fortunate. You forgot one thing, didn't you? What's that? They don't like to be robbed. We contacted the office and had them send another team out to pick up the car DeRoe had driven and take it down to the police garage. On the way down to the city hall, the suspect told us he'd been in this country about six months. He refused to talk about anything except what a great country he thought America was. Frank went to check with DMV on the suspect's car, and I took the road to the interrogation room. It's wonderful. It's the only place in the world to live. Yeah, well, all right, Duro. We got the idea you're sold on this country. Now let's get on to cases and talk about the reason we're here. How about it? It might as well be now as later. All right, fine. You want to start by telling us what you did with this stuff? I spent the money. The books are in my room. What about the other things you stole? Well, there must be some mistake. I didn't steal anything. Well, you cashed a forged check, didn't you? Yes, I admit that. And the check was stolen? It's possible, but I didn't take it. You expect us to buy that, Duro? It's entirely up to you. Where'd you get it? If I said I found it, could you prove otherwise? That won't be necessary. We can nail you on a forgery wrap right now. That's what I had in mind. I had no desire to be connected with anything else. Well, you seem pretty anxious to pick up that tab. Well, it's only right. I took a chance and lost. I'm willing to settle for my mistake. Yeah, well, that's real big of you, but I got a hunch we'll be able to tag you with more than a 470. Yeah, let me see. Yeah. What do you got? Well, I'm not sure now we got the right guy in the car theft. What? I checked with DMV. The car DeRoe was driving is registered to a Seward car company. I called him. Yeah. They tell me he works for him. We continued to question DeRoe, but he refused to admit any knowledge of the burglaries and the car theft. He was booked on suspicion of 470 PC and taken to the main jail. The next morning, the owner of the bookstore identified the suspect in a show-up. We questioned him again, but he failed to admit anything but the check forgery. 9.23 a.m., Frank and I returned to the office. You gotta hand it to the guy. He's cool. Yeah, but he's too ready to buy in on that 470. Yeah, I'll check the book. All right. Here's a number for you to call, Joe. Is there any name on it? Yeah, someone named Eilert. Give any reason for the call? Nope. Hello, I'd like to speak to Mr. Eiler, please. This is Sergeant Friday, Police Department. That's right. I see. All right, sir, we'll be right out. Do you want to give me that address? 347. Right. Thank you. The fellow runs a garage, saw the spread on our suspect in the morning paper. Yeah. He says from the description they gave, DeRoe was in his garage. Uh Uh-huh. Bought a car in to be painted. Frank and I drove out to the garage, and when we showed DeRoe's picture to Frank Eilers, he identified him as the man who'd brought in a Nash sedan to be repainted. We checked the engine number and found it listed as stolen. We went back to the office. Here's that FBI kickback. Did you read it? No, I just picked it up. Yeah, listen to this. Paul J. DeRoe, alias Paul Dawson, alias Peter Duncan. True name, Philip Paul Dorrance. Got much of a record? You'd have to take a day off to read it all. Hmm. Served terms for burglary in GTA. He's been at all the best hotels. Joliet, Sing Sing, Atlanta. Born and raised in this country. What about that war record? Joliet, 1938 to 1946. How do you like that? Well, he sure went to a lot of trouble. Having his picture taken and that get-up and that phony certificate. The way that picture looked. All those trees and the countryside. Sure looked like Holland to me, didn't it to you, Joe? Well, that's our big trouble. What do you mean? We've never been to Holland. We went back to the main jail and had the suspect brought to the interview room. He still denied any connection with the burglaries and the car thefts. 12.16 p.m. With my war record, I don't have to be subjected to Now, look, we got you made on the check, and it won't be hard to prove you stole that car. Your story falls apart like a $4 suit. I have great admiration for the Americans. Yeah, you've been telling us that. I managed to escape situations more difficult than this during the war. I was trained for it. Yeah, you told us. Of course, there was some difference then. We were all on the same side and fighting for the same things. You know, you're doing a lot of talking, but you're not saying anything. I'll tell you what you want to know. You do that? Yes. Well, all right, go ahead. I will. But first, I'd like to tell you about the shoes. About what? Shoes. What about them? I fought with the Dutch underground. Now, for a man to fight, two things are important. Is that so? A gun 
and a good pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. Many of us who wanted to fight had neither. One of your OSS men contacted us and said we would get them. And one night a plane came over and dropped containers by parachute. Yeah. The man kept his promise. We got guns, the fine carbines, and we got shoes. When daylight came, I looked at mine very closely. They had stamped on them, made in America. Yeah. And that's when I made up my mind. You did? Yes, I decided that someday I would come to the United States. Mm -hmm. I knew if I wasn't killed, I'd come here. Yeah, it's a wonderful story, isn't it? Yes, and I regret that I'll lose my chance to become a citizen. They may even deport me for this. No farther than the nearest jail. Now, please don't make light of my predicament. I admit I made this one. Oh, come on, look. Settle down, will you? I can buy a better story than yours in any magazine. All right. I didn't want to do this. But I insist that you call the Dutch consul. They never heard of you. Well, there must be a mix-up of some sort. Somebody must know me. Yeah, sure. Every prison warden in the United States. You've got a record that'll reach from here to Holland, but that's the closest you've ever been. Your real name's Philip Dorrance. The only war you ever fought was in the prison library over the daily papers. You've been in and out of every joint in the country. Now, there's more. Do you want the rest of it? No, I guess that's enough, isn't it? I might as well admit it. I'm a burglar and a car thief. You left one out. What? You're a liar. Paul Michael Duro was tried and convicted of burglary in the second degree, three counts. Grand theft auto, three counts, and forgery, one count. He received sentence as prescribed by law. Burglary in the second degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one or more than 15 years. Grand theft auto is punishable by imprisonment for not more than 10 years. Forgery is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one or more than 14 years. Dragnet. The story of your police force in action is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. There's a lot of guys in L.A. who wear black suits. Ushers, waiters, floor walkers, and the crew down at the coroner's office. Pettuccini wore a black suit, but he didn't do any of those things. He had a different angle. I found that out the first time I saw him. A big guy with a lot of black hair and a pair of hands he could have rented out to a shovel company. You know, it started last Thursday in a one-arm joint on 6th Street. I was working on a cup of coffee that would have been Exhibit A for the restaurant commission. When the skinny guy runs, the place got ambitious. Hey, bud! I'm going to go get your coffee a bear claw, maybe, huh? I'll chew on the coffee a while. I made it myself. I got a special recipe. It's a secret. Save it for the next war. We'll need some weapons. Oh. Try to please the public, and what do you get? Nothing but talk. Everybody got to have an answer. I'm going to be a big man in this business someday, and I'm going to... Sure, sure. Hey, your phone's ringing. Maybe it's J.P. Morgan. Well, your wife's got yourself, huh? Right, so it's only a girl. I ain't got one. A girl ties you down, you can't get nowhere. It's a bad business. Hello, you back coffee shop, you who? I'll ask him. Hey, bud, is your name Regan? Who wants to know? A guy named Lion. Hang up on him. Bad business, hanging up on people. Here. Okay. 
Yeah? Oh, Jeffrey, I'm glad I finally located you. I know this your day off. I'm busy. So long. Now, wait, wait, wait. Don't hang up. I wouldn't think of interfering with anything you have planned today. I I just thought I might be able to help you relax, relieve the tension. What's in it for you? Now, now, Jeffrey, uh, I... uh, I intend to watch the workouts at the Lacey Street gym today, but uh, I, I can't make it myself. Now, if you care to go, just use my name at the main gate. Uh, they'll let you right in. Who's the client? 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 I didn't say anything about a client. <clears throat> of course, if you want someone to talk to, someone who knows the ins and outs of the fine, manly sport of boxing, uh, there's a chap named Pettacini. Be sure to look him up. Give him my best regards. Old friend, room together in college. What college? Uh, 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 what college? What uh, college? Well, at the moment, it escapes me. Good night. So long. And now, wait, wait. No, oh, the truth is, Jeffrey, I don't really know this Pettigini guy at all. He retained us. But I thought you could enjoy yourself at the gym. Meet Pettigini. Talk to him. Find out what he wants. Then the first thing tomorrow, you can start right in, showing the kind of service international. That's bad business you're hanging up on people. Oh, shut up. Every time I get hot into the car, I always sit down and drink myself a cup of coffee. You want some? I'm not that hot. Oh. Is that going to be for you, that him calling back? Huh? Try hello. He'll pick it up from there. Hey, where are you going? <laughs> what do I say to him? Try hello. He'll pick it up from there. That's what you just said. Yeah. I had my choice of talking to the lion again or going straight out to the Lacey Street gym and talking to a guy named Pettuccini. I already knew what the lion had to say. Hmm? So I drove out Sunset past uh, Alvarado, found it in the middle of the block. Big pile of cement that might have been a sound stage once. I drifted through the gate and started up the ramp. That's when a little guy wearing a hat he could have used for a snood stuck out a hand. Nice for 50 cents. 50 cents to what? I worked for Anthony J. Lyon. He said to use his name. All right, you used it. Four bits. You always this nice? I won first prize this week. You must have cheated. Look, the name's Joey Arch. He used to fight Bantamweight. Now, you're tempting me, and it'll be an assault with a deadly weapon if I hit you. I'll wire for help. Oh, cut it out. All the time, answers, answers. Look, I came here to see a guy named Pettuccini. And Joey's making it tough for you, is that it? Huh? My name's Pettuccini. You looking for me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Lion sent me. <laughs> you be Regan? Joey apologized, don't you, Joey? Y- yeah, but this guy... Oh. Okay, Regan. I think I'm still fighting sometimes. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Look, I've been working out with the boys. I want to get out of these clothes and catch a shower. My office is upstairs. I'll be right up. Make yourself at home. It wasn't much of an office. A couple of rooms with a connecting wastebasket. Figured Pettuccini wasn't going to retire from what he made out of the boxing business. I was just finishing my cigarette when he walked in. This time, he wasn't wearing the sweatsuit. He was wearing a black one. But he skipped the white carnation. I didn't figure he'd do much for that white collar he was wearing backwards. Father Pettuccini? Yes, that's right. I didn't know you were a priest down there. Well, you can't punch a bag wearing a cassock. You surprised, aren't you? <laughs> I'm 38 years old, Regan, and I get surprised every day. There's no other Pettuccini around here. No, I'm the one you're supposed to see. Well, maybe the lion didn't know you were a priest either. Well, come to think of it, I may not have mentioned it when I phoned him. Yeah, I thought so. Well, Father, we'd be glad to help, but I'm not sure you have anything to be in our line. This is in your line. Oh? All right, Father, what can I do for you? Find Davy Lang. Do you know him? Middleway? Mm-hmm. One who topped uh, Al Shummer two nights ago. That's him. So a guy like Davy would be hard to lose. Not so very. You know anything about him? Well, I've seen him fight. He's a comer. Turned pro a couple of years ago, that's all. I'll tell you the rest. He's got a good right hand, and he keeps him training. He's one of my boys, Regan, and I want him back. Well, a guy like Davy can take care of himself. Nobody can take care of himself. Davy's on parole, Regan. He made a mistake once. And you'd want him to make another one. He's due to report at the, repo- at the parole office before Saturday. Well, what's he waiting for, an engraved invitation? I don't know, Regan. I haven't talked to him lately. Oh, he's disappeared. Yeah. They gave him a rule book when they let him loose. He knows what he's doing. And you and I both know what it means if he antagonizes those people. It'd be rotten if they sent him back up. Rotten. You can only do one job, Father. I'll do a dozen if I have to. That's why I wear this collar. Have you got a light? Yeah. Thanks. You know, I was raised on this street, Regan. I 
Known a lot of guys like Davy Lang, kids who make little mistakes that turn into big mistakes. You figure Davy Lang hasn't made that big one yet. I figure David Lang isn't going to make that big one. That's why I sent for you, Regan. Here, here's a check. If it takes more, I'll get it. No, thanks. You won't help me? Well, I didn't say that. When did he turn up missing, Father? Right after his bout last Tuesday night. I'm his manager and trainer till he gets going. He dropped Al Schumer in the fourth. Ten minutes later, I went to his dressing room and he was gone. I haven't seen him since. Anybody else see him? Doorman? Cab driver? No. I thought he'd call me, but he hasn't. I've been over to his place three times. No answer. Well, what do his people say? Uh, his parents dead. He lives alone at this address. Yeah. You've seen him in the ring. You know what he looks like. Yeah. Do you have a girl? I don't know. Anything else that would help? Yes. Davy's a good boy. I told you I'll do the job, Father. You'll do it better if you believe in him. Suppose it turned out different. Suppose I tell you about a middleweight named Ignatius Loyola. Look, nobody's going to put Davy's picture on a church window. You don't have to be a saint to make the finals. Even the Bible says sin's here to stay. And that's why people like me will always have a job to do. All right, Father. I'll let you know when I have something. Thanks, Regan. Oh, Regan. Yeah? You didn't ask me why I didn't call in the police. I didn't have to. Davy's not in violation until Saturday. Crosby did it. I don't know why I couldn't. This is the ultimate. I left him standing there blowing smoke rings. A kind of smile came on his face, like, like maybe he just got some inside dope and something real big. But I didn't feel like smiling. I climbed in my car and drove down the missing persons bureau. They hadn't picked up anybody who looked like Davy Lang. Then I went through the dead and unclean records over at the city morgue. Nothing there. Lincoln Heights and City Jail, all the hospitals turned up the same. Nothing. It was after seven when I got to the address Father Pettuccini had given me. A red brick apartment house in South Marathon. Davy's place was on the second floor. I pulled out a ring of skeletons and won my letter on the third key. I didn't expect to find anything. I was wrong. A blue suit with a scar across his face was standing in the middle of the room. It was dark in there, but I could still see that forty-five. Then I began to feel nervous, like a hula dancer in a forest fire. All right, Nosey, close the door. Walk over to that wall. That's right. Okay. Now, tell me you're the landlord. Hmm? Milkman? Friend of Davies? That way, huh? Well, Listen, you... Listen, bus. <laughs> Don't you guys ever learn? My knees folded like an army cot. I began to see pinwheels all over the place. He knelt down beside me and went through my pockets. I heard him grunt when he found my gun. Then he lit a match to read my billfold. He didn't like what he found there, either. Your name is Regan, and you're gum healing for Davy Lang. Who sent you? Oh. I ask you one question. Who sent you, Regan? <clears throat> Was it Mel Lawrence? Did she hire you? <clears throat> no. She'd have more brains than that. Ah, that priest, wasn't it? Davy ain't got no family. It was a sky pilot who hired you, wasn't it? Better see me. Yeah. <laughs> Better cheer. Why didn't I think of that, huh? That a chick. <clears throat> it's a good show, but I didn't catch the last act. But I did remember the advanced publicity. Any kind of preview would tell you Davy Lang hadn't just run out on a priest and parole board. There was a lot more I had to find out, and it figured Father Pettuccini wasn't going to like the way it wound up. It was an ice age later. I rolled over and found out I had some legs. Then I found a bottle of scotch on top of the stove, and that helped a lot. I tugged on it while I went around the place. There were three suits and an empty suitcase in the closet and some shirts and things in one of the drawers. And wherever David had gone, he was traveling light. I was trying to fit in the guy with the scar when I remembered him talking about a girl named Mel Lawrence. I polished off the scotch and tried the telephone book. I was lucky. It said Mel Lawrence lived over on Melrose.
I was still rocking on my heels when I rang a bell. Bell? When I saw that blonde hair, I began to feel better. She stood there and looked at me a while like I was breathing some air I shouldn't. And she turned halfway around and gave me a profile. I wasn't expecting company or I'd change clothes. You got something better in there? Do you like the way I wear my hair? Fits your face. How about my face? Do you like it? It's nice. I'm looking for a new boyfriend. Mine ran out on me. Come on in. I keep my scotch over there and my bourbon over there. I'm a model. I work three or four days a week, and the rest of the time, I don't have anything to do. Well, if things are that good, why'd your boyfriend leave? You tell me. Maybe I can help. Sure you can. Just put your arms around me and kiss me. My name's not Davy. Shut up and kiss me. Well, that wasn't the trouble. No. Tell me I'm pretty. You're pretty. Tell me you like me a lot. I like you a lot. Tell me you like to kiss me. Tell me that Davy used to tell me. Tell me all that and then tell me why he didn't pick me up. Why'd he clear out? Where's he gone? Sit down. What's the matter with me? What have I got that other girls haven't got? I said sit down. You hit me. It's time to talk sense. Who are you anyway? My name's Regan. I'm looking for Davy Lyon. What? What do you want with him? Father Pettigini hired me to find him. Father Pettigini? He wants to make sure Davy keeps his nose clean. He didn't mention your name. I never met him. Davy's told me a lot about him. Only Davy isn't around anymore to tell me about him now. Davy ran out on him. He ran out on me. Maybe he didn't. Oh, yes, he did. When Davy goes someplace, he just goes. That's all. You aren't going to find him. A blue suit with a forty-five and a scar are different. I met him I tonight. I met him tonight over at Davy's place. You know Davy's playmates. Who is he? I... I don't know a man with a scar. Who is he? I don't know. I don't know. You aren't helping Davy. I'm not Pettuccini. I couldn't help anyone. Go on, Regan. Get out of here. Get out of here. I don't feel very good. I don't feel very good at all. Well, I knew she had some more to say, but I knew she wasn't going to say it then. So I left her sitting there and got in my car and drove home. I wanted to think. I wanted to get one good reason that said Davy Lang wasn't playing on the wrong team. When the lion's around, you don't do any thinking. The lion was around. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, I'm glad you got home. I wanted to talk to you about Pettuccini. He's a priest, isn't he? Yeah, why? Uh, run any expenses yet? No. Good, then we'll drop it. I'll phone him first thing in the morning, recommend another agency. I've been thinking... You've been thinking wrong. We're staying with this one. Well, now, see here. <laughs> I'm the president of International Detective Bureau, and I can't collect a bonus from a member of the clergy. It wouldn't seem right. You better not try. Oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Those men take the vow of poverty. But we haven't taken any vow of poverty, and the agency has expenses. Now, get this. We're hired to find Davy Lang, and we're going to find him. Why? Why should we? Because everything doesn't add up to a dollar sign. No? What does A priest named Pettuccini. A guy named Davy Lang who's got a date with a parole. Now, party. wait a minute, Regan. Wait. You've been touched by this thing. Get out of here. There's something in all this is, has got to you. The humanity of the thing. Oh, I can see it now, Regan. Your picture on the front page. Me standing beside you. Brotherhood. Yeah, sure. Yeah, don't shout. The agency held up to public acclaim. Perhaps the paper starts a fund to repay us for our humble efforts. Ow. Hey. Jeffrey! Jeffrey, I haven't finished. You can't shove me out the door that way. Jeffrey, let me in. What's the meaning of this? But I didn't tell him. I was thinking of Davy Lang and a blue suit with a scar. And Father Pettuccini and a blonde who had a lot of tears. It was all out of focus, like a ten-cent movie. Blue suit sounded like he knew Davy, but I didn't like the way he'd said it. I was trying to figure why Davy'd run, and that's when I got on the phone and checked a bookmaker I know on Main Street. Hiya, baby. What's up? Davy Lang. Al Shummerbout, last Tuesday. Lang bounced him in the fourth. Well, how did figure before the fight? Oh, uh, let's see. The Lang was favored. Plenty of eight to five around town. More than usual? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a real coarse coin on that one. Anything wrong, baby? Yeah. What? It came out right. Huh? Hey, I, I don't get it. Neither do I. No, I'm going to throw that one away. But an hour later, it started to work through. It figured that Al Shummer, the other fighter, might be able to fill in some ball spots. I got his address from the Times Sports Desk and went down to his hotel. A place on Soda Street. But Al Shummer was through answering questions. He was lying on the floor when I got there. A knife the size of a baseball bat was sticking out the front of him. And he had company. Father Pettuccini. Picking up where that knife left off. You better phone the police, Regan. Who did it? When did it happen? What? 
Regan, just call the police, that's all. All right, I'll do it. But, Father... I know enough law for this one, Regan. I'm suspect number one. This is CBS, and you are listening to the story of The Man in Black. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Now, here's a special word for those of you who are interested in setting up a retirement fund. One that will permit you to have some of the good things of life before you're too old to enjoy them. I'll give you her name later. Are you satisfied with what you've been able to save so far? It's not easy to save these days, but here's a way you can do it. Start now and save before you spend by putting your savings on an automatic basis. Join the payroll savings plan where you work and invest in United States savings bonds. Under this plan, your firm sets aside whatever sum you name from each paycheck and uses the money to buy savings bonds for you. Mm-hmm. The bonds keep growing in value, paying you back $4 for every three you save in just ten years. Buy United States bonds. An investment in bonds is an investment in the future of your country. Buy United States bonds and keep them. And now back to tonight's story of the man in black and Jeff Regan... Investigator? <laughs> Had to do that. When I walked in that hotel room and found Father Pettuccini standing over what was left of Al Shummer, it didn't take 20-20 vision to see Davy Lang was running hard. And Pettuccini was blocking for him. Well, I phoned Homicide and he showed up ten minutes later. Sanducci was handling it. He changed eight shades when he saw who he had asked questions. But Sanducci's a cop. Took him 13 years to get that double-breasted suit. And he started in. All right, all right, all of you. Clear out, beat it. And dress it up later. Well, Father, you know what I gotta do? We all have our jobs, Lieutenant. I'm gonna ask you first, Regan. Well, I came over to see Al Shummer. And... and he found me beside the body. I was administering extreme unction. He was still alive? I wasn't sure, you know, in a case like yes, that. Yes, I know, Father. What business you got with Farrell Schumer? He called me, asked me to come. Why? I don't know. I found him this way. Regan, how about you? Well, I wanted to talk to him. About what? Fight. A fight, huh? It's all there is to it. To say un grande bugiardo. I speak Italian, too. Se tu vuoi sapere qual once, allora domande da me. Se tu domande, non sono esabrindiante. Provate me. Padre, io ci ho una missione, e lo devo fare. Regan, io ti domande un'altra volta. Look, once more, Regan. Tell me why you want to see Schumer. Regan works for me. Ask me the question. All right, I, I ask you. Not here. Down at headquarters, Lieutenant. Headquarters? You want me to arrest him? Regan found me in a room with a murdered man. That's enough to take me down for. But I... All right, Father. I take you into custody. And, Regan, you know what you have to do. I know, Father. Well, let's get busy. Father? Yes? I've made a thousand arrests in my day. I've taken them in for everything. You sure you want me to do this? Like you said, we all have our jobs to do. When he said that, he was looking right at me. And I began to get a helpless feeling, like a butterfly in a wind tunnel. Well, when we got downtown, Sanducci waved a hand at the prowl car and had the driver turn into the garage instead of going in the front way. Then he climbed out and talked to some uniform standing in the office. They came over and got Father Pettuccini. As soon as they were out of sight, Sam, did you turn to me? All my life I've been a cop, Regan. All the time I play it one way. I ask and they talk. If they don't, I lock them up till they do. Tonight I play it different. You didn't ask any favors. Those guys are taking him up to my office. No newspaper guys or anybody else is going to know he's in there. Then what? I won't ask him anything and neither will anybody else around here. Right now. What about tomorrow? I'm off duty, then. Before I leave, I have to ask him something. He won't tell you. This is homicide. Who is he covering for, Regan? He's counting on you to turn up something. 
You find what he wants, Regan. You find it fast and you find it alone. You've got three hours to do whatever it is. And the morning squad comes in. They like reports, and you can't stop reports. Now, Regan. Yeah? Novala Manganza. What does that mean? You better not make a mistake. Sam Ducci was bending over backwards to give me time. Three hours to find Davy Lang. That meant I had to forget the routine stuff and try other ways. I got to Melrose as fast as I could. It took her five minutes to answer the door. She didn't look happy. What are you doing back here? I forgot my homework. Say, you can't... I just did. Why, you... Now, look, lady, we can pass up the preliminaries, get to the main event. You... you... I want information. I want it fast. Where's Davy? I don't know. I lost my head and told you too much when you were here before. Where's Davy? You're hurting my arm. I'll break it if I have to. If you love him, tell me where he is. I I don't know. Really, I don't. It's just like I told you. Come on. All right, all right. I was afraid. Talk! Davy told me he meant to throw that fight with Al Shummer Tuesday night. That he'd make a lot of money doing it. That we'd go away and get married, maybe. That's all I know. That isn't enough. The odds were with Davy, he won. Well, then ask Al Shummer what happened. He's all used up. Somebody stuck a knife in him tonight. What? And homicide's holding the priest. Father Pettuccini? You know why? I, I don't. Because he thinks Davy Boy is still number one on the good parade. Now, you and I know different. Now, tell me the real setup. I can't. I don't know. Then I'll tell you. Davy was going to throw that fight. Then he found someone who'd pay him more to play it the other way. So we got together with Shummer. Shummer laid down on the fourth. Davy walked out on you and everybody. Maybe he did. But he didn't kill Shummer. I think he did. Shummer was going to talk. Davy wouldn't kill a man. He's not bad. I heard that before. But he's not... He's not bad. He didn't show up for you, did he? No, but... He double-crossed the Pettuccini by fixing a fight. Then he doubled back, didn't throw the fight. He was probably trying to double on Shummer tonight when he stuffed that shiv in his ribs. No, no, that's not Davy. Not Davy at all. No, lady. No, that's not Davy. Of course not. Davy's a real good boy. Well, I thought I had most of it when I left there. It figured Davy got a bright idea somewhere along the line and bet on himself to win. That meant he had to make a deal with Al Shummer. Only Shummer wasn't around to talk about it anymore. I figured if I walked into the station and gave that much to Pettuccini, he'd let Homicide handle it from there. But I was wrong. Regan, did you find him? No. Something's happened to him. He's blown town. I can't believe that. Father, he was fixing a fight right under your nose. Davy? He was going to take a dive, but he didn't. And Shummer, was he in on it? Well, they must have tussled over the payoff. What else? Well, he's rattled on everybody he knows, including his girlfriend. We haven't heard Davy's story. He couldn't write one good enough. Isn't it that late? Father, you can call in Sanducci right now. You can tell him what I've told you. They send out a pickup on Davy. You'll have to sooner or later. And what about the parole board? He's broken that. Shummer's dead. We don't know if he did that. Well, who else? It doesn't fit Davy. All the rest of it does. That can be cleared up. You take a lot of convincing. You're a detective, Regan. You always come up with facts. All I've got is faith. In him? I can't believe he'd kill a man. I'll get Sanducci. All right, Regan. All right. Hey, Sergeant, I... You want... Mr. Regan? Yeah. Where's Sanducci? In his office. I'll call him for you. Okay, Marquis. Right in there. Pardon me, please. Who the hell are these people? Sure, I... uh... Let's go. Yeah. Bottom of 27. Pardon me, please. Sure, I, uh... A uh, Sarge? Yeah? Never mind calling. Suit yourself, Regan. What did Father Pettuccini send for a mouthpiece? He didn't. The guy just showed up, said he was a lawyer, wanted to see him. Why? <laughs> I don't know. All right to send him in, wasn't it? I didn't answer that because the guy who passed me in the hall had his coat collar turned up. The glasses made it look good. But if he was a lawyer, he'd gone through law school in one day. I waited around outside. He wasn't in there long. Ten minutes later, he brushed out the door. I was waiting for him at the corner. Hello, Davy. How's murder these days? <laughs> easy, kid. This is a gun. You know, cop. I don't know what you told him in there, but I don't listen easy. Oh. You must be Regan. You've been looking for me. Yeah. You slip around fast. 
That gun doesn't make you look that good. I saw the guy with the shiv in him. You might have used the same line on him. Father Petticini told me how you figured it. I can't blame you. I know it must have looked that way. You got something different? I'll tell it to you. I don't expect you to believe it. Did he believe it? About me fixing up the fight? That's right. I was going to lay down for two grand. But you didn't. Who offered you four? I deserve that. But you got it wrong. Tell me how. I was up there in the ring sparring with him. It was one of those crazy things. I wanted to make it look good and... Well, Shummer's got a glass jaw. One connected and he went down for the count. Sounds like a fairy tale. I told you it wouldn't be easy. I had to run after the fight. Denton doesn't like things not to work out. When Shummer went down, the guy who was paying me lost a pile of dough. Wait a minute. The guy who was paying you... Toby Denton. The guy with the scar. Yeah. He's after me. Yeah. Yeah, he sure is. What's the matter? Well, my arithmetic's lousy. When I added this thing up, I put you in, but I left the scar out. What's that mean? It figured you killed Shummer to stop him from talking. I didn't. I can't prove it, but I didn't. Well, whoever did called the Padre to come over there. The guy who killed Shummer wanted the Padre taken in. Why? Why would he want Because he knew hooking the Padre was a sure way to smoke you out of hiding. It was all a setup to get you. Toby Denton. Yeah. Toby Denton. You figured it's smart, I... people, but you got there too late. What? It was Denton. He was still wearing the blue suit and the scar. But this time he had help, a muscle in a trench coat. They were both carrying heavy artillery. <laughs> Been waiting ten minutes for you two to finish up. Trench? Yeah? We'll just have to take Regan along with us. All right, straight ahead. Wait a minute, Toby. Regan had nothing to do with this. I'm the guy you want. Don't worry, we'll take good care of him. Me and Regan met once, didn't we, Peeper? How do you feel, Regan? Better than you will when they strap you down in that gas chamber, Tony. <laughs> Toby. You hear that, Trench? Hey, come on, Toby, let's move. Huh? We'll stay right here, Toby. Move? You know I can hardly handle myself. Gun butt wouldn't get me to. You'll have to shoot. There's a cop station half a block away. Leave Reagan, I'll go with you. I always wanted to plug somebody right outside a cop station. It was fast. He went after Toby with all he had. I got busy with the tall guy in the trench coat. He wasn't ah. fast, but he was big and he kept me busy. I landed a lucky kick that turned him green in a second, and after that it was easy. I came around to give the kid a hand, but I was a second too late. Davy took them both in his chest. That's when Toby spun around and tried for me, but this time he was too late. Oh. Lie still, kid. I'll get a doctor. Regan. Regan, I, I've done everything wrong. I, I didn't want him to get you, too. I didn't... Don't talk. You made up for it all. I, I'm not bad. All the way? No. Like the Padre always said, you're a good boy. Well, the ambulance got him to emergency hospital and they went to work on him. I waited around with Father Pettuccini all night until a nurse walked out, said that they were going to have to give Davy some transfusions, but he'd live. Then I got over to headquarters and explained the whole thing to Sam Ducci. He said it didn't make sense, but when I got Father Pettuccini on the phone, they talked it over in Italian and... Sam Ducci seemed satisfied. So it was about ten in the morning when I dropped in on the lion on the way home. He stretched out on a couch in his office. It was sagging in the middle. So was the lion. Oh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, don't disturb me. I'm ill, Jeffrey, ill. Now what's the matter with you? Oh, it's that man Pettuccini. He's a fiend, Jeffrey. Man's got an uncanny power. It isn't that... Wait a minute. Where did you see Pettuccini? At the hospital, of course. I checked with headquarters and found out what had happened, so I just thought I'd go over there. You mean you took his money after all? Took his money? Are you being funny? I walked in, the first thing I knew, he'd sven gollied me into the operating room. The operating room? Yeah, I'm a type O, Jeffrey. Me, the same blood type as Davy Lang. And you think you made this thing turn out right. <laughs> well, what are you grinning about? I don't see anything funny. You wouldn't. But cheer up, fatso. Why? Why should I? The hospital pays 25 bucks for a pint of blood. You may get something out of this yet. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. For the past three weeks, a strong-arm hold-up man has been terrorizing the downtown area. You've got a description of the thief and a method of operation for him. Your job, find him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, May 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Stad Brown. My name's Friday. I was on the way back to the office. It was 4.02 p.m. when I got to room 27. Robbery. Hi, Joe. Hi. Jim, how's it going? Pretty good. What do you got here? That's a new gimmick they're trying. Well, what's it do? Suppose let all of us in the room hear what comes over the hot shot phone. You mean without picking it up, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. How's it work? Well, look, I'll show you. See, this knob here is the volume control. Mm-hmm. You just turn it on, put the phone on it, like this. You have to adjust this little gizmo so it fits the earpiece. That's all there is to it. Mm-hmm. Where do we hear it? Through that speaker over there. Uh-huh. We've got another one hooked up in the squad room. Well, we ought to be able to hear it any place then, huh? Yeah. You don't have to get up and pick up the receiver. You can hear the whole call. Should make it a lot easier. We gonna keep it? We're just trying it out the way it looks. We'll leave it in. Ought to save a lot of steps. Yeah. Call the phone a deck, huh? Yeah, works good. A lot better than trying to juggle a phone on your shoulder and write at the same time. And the desk man doesn't have to repeat what's said to everybody in the room. It's all right. I only got one question. What's that? Wilson and Market Street, southeast corner, 211 and Slugging. Never mind, I just got the answer. Huh? It works. Wilson and Market Street, southeast corner, 211 and Slugging. Frank, Jim Austin, and I left the city hall. There was no way of telling from the hot shot call if the suspect was the one we were looking for or not, but either way, we had to check it out. It took us three minutes to get to the scene. An ambulance was in the area, and they'd answered the call. The attendant was giving the victim first aid. She was a woman in her late 50s or early 60s. Please. Oh, do something. I can't stand my soul. Please do something. Right, if you talk to her? Oh. Yeah, make it brief. we got to move her in as soon as we can. All right. <laughs> Lady, I'm a police officer. I've got to talk to you. Oh, go away. I can't talk to anybody. Can't you give me something? Please, it hurts so. Oh, we'll take care of it. Just try to relax. You got a name on her? Yes, her is there, uh, Myra McFadden. Says McFadden, can you tell us who did it? No reason. I'd give him money. He didn't have to kick me. Was it one man? When she asked for it, I'd give it to him. Did you see who it was? I can't stand it anymore, please. What's wrong with her here? Her leg's broken. Okay. Fat fracture went through the skin. Can you tell us what happened, Miss McFadden? He tried to grab my foot. I didn't know. He tried to take it away from me. Yes, ma'am. I wouldn't let him have it, and then he kicked me in the back, and I fell. Something happened to my leg. Oh, please do something, please. Just a minute, Miss McFadden. Oh, God, please help me. Excuse me, Sergeant. I'll have to give her more feet injection. Go right ahead. Oh. Oh. Was it a man? Yes. Was he tall? Yes. About five foot eight to five ten, maybe? I don't know. Or was he dark? Yes. Did he say anything to you at all? No. He just kicked me and I fell down. Was he wearing a coat? What? Was he wearing a coat? A coat? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I don't know. He just kicked me and I fell down. My, my leg it doesn't hurt anymore. I can hardly feel it. Not anymore. It doesn't hurt now. No, no. 
take her in now. Right. What'd you find out, Jim? Anything? Talked to newsboy on the corner. Did he see it? Not the beginning. Heard the woman scream, turned around, saw the guy bring his knee up here to her back, talked her on the sidewalk. Did he get a look at him? Yeah. Fellow took off down that way. Newsboy ran after him when he realized he couldn't tag him. He came back, called the ambulance. How about a description? Gave that the other fellows. They got it out. Uh-huh. Well, how's it line up to you two? All the way. It's the guy we're looking for. Well, he switched his M.O. He's hitting in the daytime now. Yeah. Something else, that old lady. Hmm? He's getting braver all the time. We talked to the witness. From what he told us about the suspect, it was the same person we were after. There was only one change in his method of operation. Instead of waiting for darkness, he was now hitting in the daylight hours. During the time we'd spent on the case, the staff's office had made several runs trying to give us some kind of a lead. Everything about the suspect had been checked and rechecked. Special show-ups were arranged, and possible suspects were shown to the victims. In spite of all our efforts, the suspect continued to run free. Wednesday, May 5th, Frank and I stopped for dinner across the street from the city hall. It's a big thing now. What's that? Mambo. Hmm? Mambo. Dance step. Faye's been trying to get me to learn. She sees it on TV all the time. Mm-hmm. Faye says a man looks sophisticated when he does it. That's what she says, huh? Yeah. You think it would? Would what? Make me look sophisticated. Well, you want me to be honest? Sure, Joe. I don't think anything could do that for you. Well, I'm glad to hear it all, buddy. Mm-hmm. I'll tell Faye. Keep her off my back about taking them lessons. Mm-hmm. Hi, Joe. Oh, hi, Dick. How's it going? Oh, pretty good. Uh, Donahoe said you was over here. Uh-huh. It's my partner, Frank Smith. This is Dick Blake, writes for the L.A. Examiner. Hi. I haven't seen you for a while, Frank. Oh, yeah. Hi, Dick. Want a cup of coffee? No, no, thanks. I just had dinner. You looking for something special, Dick? I'd like to get a story on the strong arm man you fellas are after. Anything you can give me? No, you got about all of it. Now, what about the McFadden woman? She going to be all right? Well, I haven't heard anything. I called the county hospital this afternoon. Yeah? Said her leg's been set. Gonna take some time to heal. They're giving her a new kind of serum. She's gonna be all right, though, huh? They're not sure yet. They don't know if there's any injury to her spine. Yeah, sure, a rough one. Well, that's the way this guy does business. You know, we've been getting calls for the last ten days. Letters to the editors, everything. You know, we can get in line. They could be coming at us from all sides. What do you got on them? Well, we ought to put out a mimeographed answer to that. Hmm. We can take a lot of paper. Is there anything I can have? No secret. Most of the victims have told us the same story. Guy comes up to him and starts a conversation. About a ride someplace, cup of coffee, anything to slow the victim down from me. Uh-huh. First chance he gets, he slams the victim into a wall and asks for the money. Now, before the McFadden woman, he worked at night, didn't he? Yeah. What about his choice of victims? A possible tie in there? Mm-mm. Not that we can find. Anybody on the street is right. You got a description on him? Yeah, white male American, around 30, dark hair, dark eyes. 165 pounds, 585 pounds. That's a couple of thousand people. Yeah. Now, what about the area he's working? Is there anything there? Well, seems to make most of his pickups down around the plaza. And what about the victims themselves? What do you mean? Well, they usually look like they're carrying money or No, what? not all the time. Last week, he beat up a serviceman in civilian clothes. He took $44 from him. Kid didn't look like he had a dime in his pocket. Yeah. Nothing about this guy fits a pattern, Dick. There's only one thing we can drop in a pocket. He's mean. The way he works, the kick he gets out of beating up a person, it's got to mean more than just money to him. Yeah. Well, one more thing. How close are you? Outside a country mile. Yeah. Half the division's been on his tail. This keeps up, and Metro's going to ask for an increase in budget to hire more men. We've got the area covered like rain, and he don't get wet. Mm. Well, i got to get back to the office. Write something. Try to take it easy on us, will you? Look, we're on your side. Now, thanks for the help. Okay, see you around, huh? Right. So long, Frank. Hey, cool, huh? Yeah. Anything comes up, let me know, huh? We get something, you'll hear about it. Sure like to get a break on the story. Well, we're both even there. Huh? So would we. For the next week, the patrol of the streets continued. The strong arm bandit hit three more times. Each time, the victim and the witnesses gave us the same description. It matched the suspect we were looking for. Thursday, May 13th, 7.52 p.m. We got back to the squad room. Anything come in? Yeah. Kick back on Whitey. How's it look? No good. What do you mean? Well, according to Bracken, he's been in jail for the last two months. Yeah? He's waiting for trial in Stockton. What does it say what he fell for? Armed robbery. Hmm. Graduated, huh? Yeah, looks like it. I get it. Robbery Friday. Hello. Yeah, well, could you speak up? I can't hear you. Yeah, that's better. How's that? Well, what was that name again? 
Yeah, well, now, give me your name. No, we can't do much with that. What do you got? The fellow says the name of the strong arm bandit's Benny Jessup. Well, what about the person who called? Hung up. Anonymous, huh? Yeah. Well, what do you think? There's one way to find out. Yeah? Ask Benny Jessup. After we checked the name through R and I, Frank and I went out to Benny Jessup's address. Benny Jessup? Yeah, what do you want? You Benny Jessup? Yeah. Police officers want to talk to you. You looking for something special? A couple of questions we want to ask you. Sure, I got no beef with the cops. Appreciate it. If you keep it short, I got big trouble. But this salsa might help. Yeah. Uh, must have got a hold of some bad food. Really? Uh, excuse me. Yeah. What's it all about? You ever been arrested, Jessup? Yeah, look, it'd be a lot easier and faster if I start off telling you I've been the route, huh? You guys checked the record before you came up here. You know, I thought once for burglary, you know, I'm free now. I don't owe nobody nothing. Let's go from there. All right, you got a job? Yeah. What do you do? I'm a candy butcher. What's that? I sell candy. Where? One of the theaters downtown. When do you work? Nights. Name them. Monday through Saturday. What hours? Check in at 4, work till 11, 11.30. How come you're not there tonight? I told you, I'm sick. How long you had the job? Oh, a couple of years. Anybody at the theater to back that up? What do you mean? Well, anybody will say you're there. Look, you better tell me what this is about, huh? I'm not hung up on anything. I got no part of any action you guys are in on. Well, it comes down to one thing. If you can prove you're working every night, you're clean. Yeah, I know that now. How do you sell this candy? Hmm? Where are you in the theater when you work? All over, storeroom, lobby, all over. You got a regular stand or you work in the aisles? Stand in the lobby. Somebody there to take tickets? Yeah. Well, I ought to be able to tell it then, shouldn't I? Tell you nothing. I've been working since I got out of the joint. You go down there and start asking a lot of questions, you're going to cause a lot of trouble. Is that right? Why will you get me fired? Don't worry about it. Yeah, easy to say. You haven't got the job. Better call and check, huh? Yeah. You got a phone? You see one around? Give me the number. I don't know it. You work there, but you don't know the phone number. I forgot. Where is the place? Clarence Third and Weller. What's the manager's name? You got to talk to him. Now, look, I can do it on the phone, or we can go on down there. How do you want it? Name's Woodrum. I'll check it, Joe. Well, if you tell me what this is about. If it fits, you'll know. Who turned you on me? What? Look, who tried the box job? You got reason to come up here. I don't know what you're digging for, but I'm not around. Somebody gave you my name, didn't they? We heard it. Who? Well, if we told you the truth, you wouldn't believe it. Somebody I know? That's hard to say. You just need two words. What's that? First and last name. We got a call. We don't know who it was from. Person said we were looking for you. And you barrel up here and roust me. You got no rousting. We had to check it out. What is it? Burglary? No. Well, then I'm home free. Only thing I ever fell for. I learned. How about it? You talk to Woodrum? Yeah. What about my job? The alibi hole. He's been there every work night for the last four months. And I told you that. All right, you're out, but somebody's on your back. Nothing new. I've been carrying a lot of people. All right, Jessup, we'll leave it right there. Keep your nose clean. Thanks a lot, cop. I'm not sure I want you on my team. Huh? But what about my job? What did Woodrum say? You got no trouble. What do you mean? He says take care of yourself. Yeah? Be at work tomorrow night. We'll see you around, Jessup. I didn't tell him everything. What? I talked to the manager on the phone. He filled me in. Yeah. You know the guy who called you? Yeah, what about him? He's an usher down there. Yeah. He wants to be a candy butcher. Frank and I left Jessup and went downtown to talk to the theater manager in person. He verified the fact that Jessup had been at work during the hours of the robberies. Other people who worked in the theater were questioned. Their statements ruled out Jessup as our suspect. Another day went by. There were several strong-arm robberies in the downtown area, but none with the same viciousness used by our suspect. Saturday, May 15th, Frank and I got back to the office. Hi, Joe. Frank. Jim. Hi. What do you got there? Talked to Skipper this afternoon. Had a meeting with Chief Brown. Yeah. They drew the line, said we got to come up with something. Well, we got half a minute Metro working on it now. All the streets are covered. There's not much more we can do. The guy's got to make a mistake. All we need is a little time. Skipper just cut off the supply. Well, you have any ideas? Yeah, I've been going over. Take a look at this man. Mm-hmm. Most of the strong arms have been taking place in this area. Yeah. We've had cars here, here, along here, and uh, covering the alleys in here. Mm-hmm. But suppose we put our own men in that area on foot. Decoy system, huh? Yeah. Only thing we haven't tried. Well, it might work. Something to do. How do we set it up? 
Guy makes most of his pickups around the plaza, right? That's right. And we start from there. Each night, one of us walks around the street, try to pick the guy up. Other two follow in the car. So what's the captain think of the idea? I haven't talked to him yet. He can't be. It's a possibility. And when do we start? How about tonight? Well, let's go. Wait a minute. Who's going to do the walking? Doesn't make a lot of difference. How about flipping a coin? All right. Hi, Ben. Fine. That's one you didn't get, Joe. Well, I win. I hope so. For the next two days, the plan was carried out. The thief didn't hit. They began to wonder if he'd quit his operation. Monday, May 17th, while Frank and Jim Austin followed me in Unit 1K80, I acted as decoy. 12.47 a.m. It looked like another wasted night. Don't shove, cop. Just do what you're told. It'll save you a lot of trouble. Jim? Yeah, here you go. All right, you. Hands down. Mm-hmm. Turn around. What's your name? Why don't you find us? We will. We want to save time. Joe Schaefer. What's your name, fella? What's your name? You're not going to do any good with him. What do you mean? He's deaf. His hearing aid's broken. You're not getting through at all. Is that so? Well, then you tell us his name. Sidney Remler. Just the two of you in this? You see anybody in I ask you a question. You got an answer? What'd you tell him? I can't hear what you said. Never mind. I told you you wouldn't get through to him. You got it wrong. Huh? We'll get through. You are listening to Dragnet. The authentic story of your police force in action. Frank, Jim Austin, and I took the suspects to the city hall for questioning. You guys got nothing on us. You're sitting in the wrong place, fella. That right? We got you made on tonight. Time we get through, we'll tag you for at least ten more pounds. You better stick to coffee. Isn't anybody going to let me know what's going on? Can't you fix that thing We'll get it taken care of. Where do you guys live? Big cop. That's what you pay All right, we can do it the hard way if that's how you want it. You get no help from me. That works both ways. You're whistling anyway. You maybe got us for tonight, that's all. What's going on? Oh, shut up. Be careful what you tell them. You guys work alone? You got a reason I think there's anybody else? We want you to tell us. You're off your rocker, cop. You better put a button on that mouse shaper. Where you treated people doesn't give you a soft ticket. Doesn't make any difference how I got it. I'm going to ride it all the way. Yeah, well, you stick with that and see where you land. Oh, really off your rocker. Isn't anybody going to tell me what's going on? All right, take everything out of your pocket, shaper. What? Come on. Just put it right there on the table. A lot of paper there. You always carry that much money? Yeah. How much is there? I don't know. You must have some idea. Uh, maybe three, four hundred dollars. You work for a living? No. Where'd you get the money? From a bank. What'd you use to take it out? What? A gun or a pen. I didn't steal it. If that's what you're trying to build. A lot of money. How'd you get it? My old man left it to me. Well, you don't work at all, then, huh? No, I don't believe in it. How about him? No. No, he doesn't work either. What'd he say about me? He wants to know if you work. Huh? He wants to know if you work. No, none of us do. Giles, Dave, and me have incomes. None of us work. Shut up. Who's Dave? I don't know. Now, look, we're about through playing games with you. You come in here like you're 12 feet tall and try to throw your weight around. Well, it isn't going to work. The sooner you realize it, the better it's going to be for you. Now, how about it? Who is he? You know, we'll come up with it. How much do you think you'll do to get you out of here? What do you can? No, that's not going to hold your stuff. You can call it two ways. Easy and yours. Now, which is it going to be? How about it? What do you want to know? This day, what's his full name? Sansell. Was he with you in all the robberies? Yeah. What about tonight? He stayed on. Why? He set up all the others. We figured we'd pull this one by ourselves. Where's he now? I don't know. Home, I guess. Where's that? An apartment out on Fountain. That's in Hollywood? Yeah. What's the phone number? What are you going to do? 
Just give me the phone number, will you? Hollywood 98844. I'll dial it. You just talk. You gonna use the gadget, Joe? Yeah, we might as well. All right. Didn't all listen. Hollywood 98844. Yeah. And when he answers, you just talk right into that thing. Hey, Dave. We'll see you. Uh, as soon as you get home, we'll have a celebration, huh? Yeah, sure. Hey, I'll tell you what. I'll give the girls a call. Sound all right to you? Yeah, it's fine. Oh, one thing, though. What's that, Dave? You know that, Helen. Always got a couple of crow girlfriends around. You better stop on the way home, huh? What for? Well, see if you can pick up a couple more guys. <laughs> We ran David Santel's name and description through R&I, and we found that he'd served a term at the county jail for violation of the State Narcotics Act. There was no record on either Giles Schaefer or Sidney Remler. Remler was taken to the main jail, and Frank and I, along with Jim Austin and Giles Schaefer, drove out to Santel's apartment. It was a large place in the Hollywood area. While Jim Austin stayed with the suspect, Frank and I checked with the manager. He told us that Santel had left a few minutes before we got to the place. The four of us went inside. Now, you go over there and sit down. You guys sure throw muscle around. Yeah, we got a long way to get you. All right, what am I supposed to do when Dave comes back? Just sit there and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you know, it's going to be pretty interesting. What's that? The expression on your face when the judge turns us loose. Well, don't make book on that. Place is clean, Joe. Right. You guys never do one on a stage work and you always live high, don't you? Stay there, Shaper. Aren't you all set? Yeah. Watch your face! Oh, you know, is there anything else you want to throw? No. You cause me more trouble, I'll make a hole in you big enough to walk through. All right, all right. Turn around. Nice, clean. Put your hands down. You don't need those. I'm not going to give you any trouble. Let's make sure. I told you not to put those on me. Try to muscle us, cop. I got a lawyer. He's going to be on the carpet for this. Time we get through with you, I'll have you walking a beat so far out, you'll be lucky to get home on weekends. You know, you punks make me sick to my stomach. You lean on some old man or woman, you strong arm a service man, you got about as much guts as an underfed worm. Why don't you save it for the court? You huh? sit on your mouth, fella. I'll let you know when I'm through. I'm going to tell you something. You remember what happened to you tonight. You put it on the wire and get it around to the rest of the two bit bums that worked this same filthy operation. You tell them every time they put the arm on an old man, every time they slug a service man, they're never going to know. It might be a cop, and if it's not, there'll be four of us waiting in the next doorway. So before you roll that next victim, you think about that, will you? You got it all off your chest now? No, I got one more thing for you. You're going to jail, and we're going to drop every book we got on you. There's a mirror in the car. On the way in, you look at it and smile. What for? Be happy you still got all those teeth. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 14th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Giles Herbert Schaefer, David Arthur Santel, and Sidney Thomas Remler were tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree, 14 counts, and received sentence as prescribed by law. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than five years on each count. Because of the viciousness shown by the suspects, their sentences were set to run consecutively. Dragnet is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a juvenile detail. In the past six weeks, a junior high school has been broken into three times, and extensive damage has been done by vandals. Your job, investigate. It was Monday, March 9th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of juvenile detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Powers. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office. It was 8.32 a.m. when we got to the Hillside Junior High School, the vice principal's office. Good morning. May I help you? Yes, ma'am. Police officers, we'd like to see Miss Ridley. Oh, yes. You've been here before, haven't you? That's right. Uh-huh. Miss Ridley's expecting you. You can go right in. Thank you very much. Come in. Good morning, officers. Come in, please. And sit down. Thank you. You seem to be getting more than our share of trouble. Yes, ma'am. What is it this time? Same as before. A little more serious. Cafeteria? Yes. Wait until you see the place. Just downright vandalism. Food thrown all over on the walls and the floor. Mm -hmm. But they didn't stop there. What do you mean? The student's supply store was broken into. In fact, that's where the entrance was made. Yeah? Girl in charge says that a number of items are missing. What was taken? Things the students use in school. Notebooks, pencils, fountain pens. I see. There were a lot of transportation books taken, too. Those are the kind of kids use on the buses and streetcars, don't you Yes, mean? that's right. Well, they have serial numbers, don't they? Yes, we keep a record of them in the office. You'll be able to give us a list of the numbers on the missing books? Oh, yes. All right, fine. What if we could take a look at that store room? Surely. It's right next to the office. I wasn't so sure the last time, but I am now. What do you mean? About who's responsible for this. You got an idea who might have done it? Well, I'm pretty sure it must be a student or a former student. Why do you say that, Miss Ridley? Well, there's the window they entered. Mm-hmm. Somebody must have known that this window opened into the storeroom. Yeah. Screen's torn here and the window's broken. You have somebody special in mind who might have done this? No. It wouldn't be fair to cast suspicion on any boy or girl without proof. Well, have you had trouble with any students since we were here last? Yes. What was wrong, ma'am? During study periods, a group of five boys were causing minor disturbances. Uh Uh-huh. But it's all been straightened out. I had a talk with the leader of the group. Found out he wanted to take part in school athletics. His parents didn't want him to, afraid he might be injured. Mm Mm-hmm. So I called them in for a conference. We talked, and they finally agreed to let the boy participate in school sports. Mm Mm-hmm. That's all there was to it. Haven't had any trouble since. How about the other boys? They weren't really bad. Without a leader, they just settled down. I'm sure it wasn't any of them. Mm-hmm. What if you could tell us if anything has been moved in here? No. This is just the way we found it. Mm-hmm. wonder why they didn't mess this room up, too. I don't know. I've been teaching for 20 years, and I'm pretty sure of one thing. What's that, ma'am? Children do wrong but not because they want to be tough or brave. Usually because they're afraid of something. Mm -hmm. Most of them are pretty frightened kids. They need help. Well, we'll buy that. The problem is, what happens to them if they don't get it? I'm afraid you know the answer to that one better than I do. They'll still be around. Yes? As frightened adults. In the cafeteria, we found conditions about the same as we had after the previous acts of vandalism at the school. The refrigerator had been ransacked. Cartons of milk along with containers of ice cream and frozen foods had been smashed against the walls and the floor. The tables had been overturned and the chairs had been thrown around and broken. The floor was covered with glass. Frank put in a call to Leighton Prince and they sent a crew out to go over the storeroom and the cafeteria. Miss Ridley told us that she had already notified school security. Before we left, she furnished us with a complete list of stolen articles and the serial numbers for the missing student transportation book. We returned to Georgia Street and met with Captain Powers. You're pretty sure it's juveniles? Yeah, the kind of stuff that was taken, the damage done, sure points that way. Any help from Miss Ridley? Yeah, but she couldn't give us any names. No teacher-pupil problem. Yeah, she mentioned a minor case. It said it had been cleared up. Mm-hmm. 
This is the third time in six weeks for the school, isn't it? Yeah. Kids don't usually travel very far for these deals. It's a good chance that some of them from the school. Well, now, the way it looks, if they try to peddle the stuff to the other kids, we might be able to get a lead on them. Mm-hmm. There's a hitch to that, though. What do you mean? Well, Miss Ridley said that she was going to make an announcement to the student body. Yeah. She's going to tell them to be on the lookout for the stolen article. Mm-hmm. Kids that took the stuff from school, they might lay low for a while. That's it. How much was taken? About $500 worth of school supplies. A pretty good haul. Yeah. What do you want to do about it? Well, if it's all right with you, Frank and I'd like to put a stake out on the school. All right, when? We know the janitors work into the early morning hours on Fridays. Yeah. So it figures the school must be broken into sometime on Saturday or Sunday. All right, when do you want to start? This coming weekend. Okay, I'll arrange a clearance for you with school security. Right. Any more help you need, let me know. Whoever did it must have something against the cafeteria. The place was a real mess. Yeah. Bad enough the first couple of times. Didn't leave anything in the freezer this trip. Sure doesn't make much sense. I don't know. Maybe it does. What? Each time they hit the cafeteria, right? Yeah, that's right. They didn't tear up the storeroom. We threw a few pencil boxes around. That's about all. Yes, but every time food has been destroyed. That's right. Well, we got a reason for doing it. Yeah? Somebody that can't resist the urge to eat all the time doesn't like being overweight. So without knowing why they do it, they destroy food. Mm-hmm. It could be a part of it, anyhow. It's only a theory, but it might hold water. Yeah, well, that's true, but we don't know if it's a gang we're after or just one person. Another thing, they've broken in three times. Might have been by different kids. Good questions, all of them. Yeah. That's why you get paid, hmm? to get the answers. kept in contact with Miss Ridley during the rest of the week, but as far as she knew, none of the stolen articles showed up. Captain Powers talked with the school security section of the Board of Education, and Frank and I staked out in the school on Saturday and Sunday. There was no disturbance. We went back the following weekend. Saturday passed without trouble. Sunday, 7.34 p.m., we were sitting in the vice principal's office. Frank, yeah, come on. Right. All right, son, come on, party's over. What? Come on, son. Grab him, Let me go, let me go. Right, take it easy, boy. Now, take it easy. This isn't going to help. Just hold still. What's your name? Jerry. What's your last name? Bethel. You've done this before? Come on, son, answer me. All right, let's go. You going to put me in jail? We'll see. I'm not afraid of you, cops. There's no reason you should be. Why'd you throw all this food around? I don't know. You haven't got a reason? No. She went to a lot of trouble to catch me. Not too much, son. Huh? You made it easy. Before leaving the school, Frank called school security and notified them of the broken window and the damage done by Jerry Beckel. We drove back to Georgia Street to question the subject further. On the way down, he refused to say anything. At the office, he told us he lived at 1206 Walnut Street. Frank went to check Central Juvenile Index. 8.42 p.m. That's all. Not going to tell you any more. Now, let's get one thing straight, son. You're in trouble. We'd like to help you, but you've got to play ball with us. We'll level with you, but you've got to play it the same way. Now, do you understand? Yeah. All right. Now, we can't do anything for you unless you want us to. Unless we know why you do these things, it'll be pretty hard for you to find a way out. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Well, the only way we can find out is if you tell us the truth. Joe? Yeah. Yeah. The boy has no previous record. Mm-hmm. All right, how about it? You ready to answer our questions now, son? Sure. But it won't do any good. Why do you say that? Can't change my looks, can you? Well, why? There's no reason to do that. You look healthy to me. Sure, I'm healthy. Fat and ugly, too. That's why I had the trouble with Miss Ridley. Well, now, suppose you tell us about it. She kicked me out of school. Why? Fight. Who are you fighting with? Oh, different guys. Why'd you fight called me names. All right, go ahead. It's my fault. I can't help how I look. You sure that's why you had the fight? It wouldn't let me alone. Suppose you think I'm real good looking, huh? Son, I told you we'd level with you. You're not an ugly kid. Now, it seems to me you're imagining a lot. Sure. I suppose they call me Lard Barrel and Witch Man because they imagined it too. Huh? Maybe they got another reason. Like what? To needle you. If you didn't let them know it bothered you, they probably wouldn't have kept it up. They called your names to get you into fights. Don't you think that's it? That's what you say. Well, that's what we believe. She didn't have to kick me out of school. How many fights do you have, Jack? I don't know. Well, you must have some idea. Quite a few. Miss Ridley talked to you? Yeah. 
She gave you more than one chance, didn't she? Yeah. But the kids kept after me. Wouldn't let me alone. You don't like Miss Ridley, do you? Why should I? Is that why you broke into the school? Maybe. How many times did you go in? Three. Did you steal the things from the storeroom? Yeah. Where are they? Huh. You live with your father and mother? Yeah. Any brothers or sisters? Two brothers, three sisters. Well, now, when you had the trouble at school, did Miss Ridley talk to your parents? No. She didn't get in touch with them at all? Sure, she tried, but they didn't go in to see her. Is there any reason why they didn't? No, just didn't go, that's all. Well, I guess we better go out and have a talk with them this time. Why? Well, I'll have to know about this trouble that you're in. Maybe if we talk to them, we can sort of work this problem out together, don't you think? That won't do any good. Why not, son? They think I'm fat and ugly. Jerry Beckel went on to say that he was now attending the Jansen School, one of two maintained in the city for juveniles who have difficulty making adjustments in normal school life. He also told us that on all three occasions he had been alone when he broke into the Hillside School. We drove out to his home. It was a small frame house, badly in need of repair. We met his father, Henry Beckel. We told him the reason for our visit. So you just can't stay out of trouble. First it's fighting and you get kicked out of school. Now this mess. What's the matter with you anyhow? I don't know, Dad. Excuse me, Mr. Beckel, but this kind of talk isn't going to get us anywhere. Your son has a definite problem and he needs help. Sure, he's got a problem. He's no good. Never has been, never will be. You want to take the boy outside? Sure. Come on, son. I suppose you're going to give me the answers. You sound like you think it's my fault he got into this trouble. Well, you might have helped keep him out of it. Sure, just follow him around all day and night, slap his wrist when he steps out of line. You were asked to go over to his school when he had trouble before. Why didn't you go? I didn't have the time. I got to worry about five other kids. They got to eat. Can't be taking time away from work just because one of them can't keep his nose clean. What about your wife? What do you mean? Well, couldn't she have gone over to the school? Mm-hmm. Why don't you ask her? Is she here now? Nope. Gone out, probably at a movie. But she has to have some fun, so she leaves me with the kids. Is there any reason why she couldn't go and talk with Miss Ridley about your son, Jerry? Yeah. She figured it was his own problem. So he has to learn to fight his own battles. Well, that's fine when you know what you're fighting. Your boy doesn't. Nothing the matter with him. That's where you're wrong. Your son has an inferiority complex about his looks. Oh, big deal. That's one of the things that's wrong with him. You trying to tell me he gets into trouble because of the way he feels about his looks? It's possible that's a good part of it. You gonna have to go to jail? I'm afraid he will. Don't you put kids on probation sometimes, let the parents look after them? Yeah, when they have parents. Well, couldn't you do that for Jerry? If you could show the authorities that you'd be responsible for him, it might work out. I could do that. There's something more you got to do. Hmm? Find time to talk to him. We took the subject along with the recovered stolen property back to Georgia Street. The next day, Miss Ridley came down and identified the articles as those taken from the school storeroom. She said that Jerry Beckel had been in numerous fights before he was dismissed from school. During her investigation of the disorder, she found that Beckel had provoked several of the fights. She went on to say that the subject had been a below-average student, showing little interest in academic work. A petition was filed in Beckel's behalf with the juvenile court. The petition was sustained, and he was placed on probation with the Los Angeles County Probation Department and allowed to remain in the custody of his parents. March 31st, 8.06 a.m. I just picked up the reports for yesterday. You want to check them over? Yeah, all right. Thanks. I saw the skipper on the way in. Yeah. You remember that Austin boy? Car thief, wasn't he? Yeah. Violated his probation. Picked up again last night. Mm, too bad. What was that kid's name on the Hillside School case, that heavy set boy? Mm, one that thought he was so ugly? Yeah, that's the one. Beckel or someone. Yeah. What about him? Well, look here. The description on this report fits him. And listen to this. Victim states the subject said to her, What are you smiling for because I'm so ugly? It might be. What's the charge? Pretty bad this time. Yeah. Attempted robbery and shooting. You are listening to Dragnet. The authentic story of your police force in action. The robbery.
robbery and shooting had occurred the previous night about 7.30 p.m. We checked with the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, and we found the victim, Linda Cotterly, had been treated for a minor flesh wound in the leg. She'd been shot with a 22 caliber pistol. The hospital report showed that she'd been released and allowed to return home. We contacted the officers working the case and checked the reports that had been filed. We asked if we could talk to the victim. Frank and I drove out to the address, and we were admitted by her sister. Linda Cotterly was lying on a couch in the front room. We identified ourselves and asked her if she'd mind going over the story for us. I told the other officers all about it. Yes, we understand that. We saw their report, but we appreciate your telling us just what happened. Well, I guess it won't do no harm. I suppose if more of you know about it, you'll have a better chance to catch a little stinker. That's right, ma'am. I shouldn't have said that. Ma'am? Little stinker. He was a big stinker. Oh, yeah. Could have killed me. Gives me cold chills thinking about it. We can understand. I wonder if you'd do something for me. Yes, ma'am. What's that? There's an afghan on the sewing machine in the dining room. Would you get it for me? Sure. Thank you. I wonder if you'd tell us the story. Sure. Well, you know, I was shot in the leg right here. Yes, we know. First, I thought it was just some kid playing a joke. Here you are, ma'am. Oh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Would you just drape it over me? Gently now. All right. That's fine. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Now, you said you thought it was a joke when this boy tried to hold you up. Yeah, he was so young looking. Couldn't have been more than 15 or 16. Yeah. He was sort of chubby. Didn't look mean at all. I guess I should have been scared, but I wasn't. I just smiled. Did he say anything when he approached you? About it being a hold-up, you mean? That's right. No, came up to me. He had a gun in his hand. That's when you smiled. That's right. Then what happened? He got a real mad look on his face. Made him look tough. Is that when he spoke to you? How'd you know? Well, it's in the report. Well, that's right. I'd forgotten. Well, then I guess I can skip the part about what he said. We'd like to hear his exact words, if you can remember them. He said, what are you smiling for, because I'm so ugly? Mm-hmm. Did you get a good look at him? Mm-hmm. Yes and no. Well, how do you mean that? Well, I did see him, but I don't remember his face too well. I know he was young. Not too good looking, but it's hard to say just what he did look like. You think you'd know him if you ever saw him again? Oh, well, might. It's pretty dark, I'm not sure. All right, what happened after he spoke to you? I said no, meaning I didn't think he was ugly. And they told me to give him my purse. That's when it happened. What was that, then? I got scared. I knew he wasn't fooling. I screamed and started running. Then I heard the noise, gunfire. Right, go ahead. Then I felt a sting on my leg when the bullet hit me. Kept on running, went past a vacant lock. Kept screaming, and then I saw a man across the street open his front door and look out. I ran up to him, told him I'd been shot, and he called the police. When you said this person was chubby, did you mean he was fat? Well, he was kind of big around the middle, and his face was sort of round like. How about his hair? Was it dark? Yeah. Did you notice if it was straight or wavy? No. Tell me, you got an idea who this kid was? Well, we're not sure. Hmm. Well, I know one thing. What's that? That kid should be taught a lesson. Yeah. Only one thing to do with them when they're that rotten. Slap them around a little and just forget about them. Well, that's the trouble here. Hmm? That's what they did to this boy. <laughs> Frank and I went back to the office and checked the records on the petition, and we found that the subject's father, Henry Beckel, was employed at a lumber yard. We drove down to the place and found him stacking lumber in the back lot. What's on your mind this time? How's Jerry been getting along? All right, I guess. Attending school regularly? As far as I know, haven't had any bad reports. What's he been doing nights? He stays in the house. Goes out once in a while, never too late. Why? Where was he Monday night? Home. All night? Yeah. How about Tuesday? After supper, he went out for a while, came in early. Why? How's your son been acting lately? What do you mean? Has he had any trouble at school? I told you, I haven't had any bad reports from him. How about at home? No trouble. We're trying to help him. Well, and as far as you know, he's been in pretty good spirits. Is that right? Look, you know he's no ball of fire, but he seems to be happy enough. Uh Uh-huh. What is all this, anyway? We're just checking something out. Well, the way he asks questions, it sounds like you think Jerry's in trouble again. No, we didn't say that. Well, you don't have to. I know what you're getting at, and I don't like it. No reason to get upset. They're right. How would you feel? Jerry's been released to my custody. You're as much as telling me I haven't been doing the right thing. Well, if you're sure of that in your own mind, you don't have anything to worry about, do you? Well, I've done what I can, but I can't watch him all the time. What's he supposed to have done this time? We're not sure he's done anything. He wouldn't be nosing around if he didn't have some reason. Just something we got to check. All right. But if he got off on the wrong foot again, don't try to pin any tails on me. I've been doing the right thing, but I don't mind telling you I... I've never been too sure he would straighten out. Is that right? Yeah. But I'm doing what I can for him. Yeah? I feed him, I put clothes on his back, I put a roof over his head. What more can I give him? You own a gun, Mr. Beckel? What? I said you own a gun. Yeah, why? What kind? Twenty-two pistol. We 
drove over to the Jansen School and we talked to the principal. We explained our business and he told us that Jerry Beckel hadn't been in school all day. We drove out to the boy's home and we met his mother. He said he wasn't there, but he'd probably be home about 5 o'clock. We went back to the car and waited. At 4.30 p.m., Henry Beckel returned from work. He drove into the yard and we met him at the back door. So you're here again. That's right. Let's go in the house, Beckel. You want it. Go ahead. You want to tell me what this is all about now? We'd like to talk to Jerry first. Well, if you want to see him, why didn't you go over to his school? We did. He wasn't there today. The kids up to his old tricks. Oh, they found you. This is my wife. We've met. What's the trouble? Jerry again. He wasn't in school today. Is that all? We should get out of the kitchen so I can fix supper. Yeah. You guys want to come on into the other room? All right. While we're waiting for your son, I wonder if you'd get that gun for us. Uh, why I should? You've got no choice, fella. In the closet. You said that before. Now, where is it? Over there. Where? It's in that box. A small flat one. This one here? Yeah. When's the last time you fired this? I don't know. It's been quite a while. What do you think? It smells like it was fired recently. What time does Jerry usually get home, Beckle? We eat at 5.30. He'll be here by then. Uh Uh-huh. You don't have to worry about him not showing up. He might skip school, but that fat, lazy slob won't miss a meal. Mm Mm-hmm. Eats twice as much as the other kids. No wonder he looks like he does. Let's go. Right. Go on in, Washington. Hi, son. Hi. What do you want? I'm afraid we're going to have to take you with us. Can he eat first? It won't hurt him any to miss a meal. Look at him. Looks like a fat toad. Well, why don't you say... All right. Doesn't make any difference. You'd like to be rid of me anyway. Take it easy, son. You all want to hear it? Okay, I'll tell you. I shot her. We took Jerry Beckel down to Georgia Street for further questioning. After the outbreak at his home, he quieted down and he refused to say anything more. We talked to him for an hour and he finally admitted the whole story. All right, son, why'd you take the gun? To get some money, I guess. Well, now, was that the only way you could get it? I don't know. You could have gotten a job. I tried to. Yeah. Nobody wanted me. Well, how many people you asked for work? Just one place. And then you gave up. That was enough. I knew I wouldn't get a job. Did they tell you they wouldn't give you work? I didn't have to. I knew just the way they looked at me. Did you ever ask your father for money? Yeah. He gave me and he just read me off. What did he say to you? What he always does. I'm fat, lazy... Not good for anything but put my feet under the table and eat. So you decided to get out and rob somebody, huh? Yeah. Why'd you shoot at the woman? I'm not sure. Well, she didn't do you any harm, did she? No. She made me mad, laughed at me, just like all the rest. She did, huh? Sure. Because I'm fat. Did she say that? No. I could tell what she was thinking. You could, huh? People shouldn't laugh at somebody just because they're fat. Yeah. They got no right to do that. Maybe. But how much did you have? Huh? When you shot her. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 14th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Howard Beckel was remanded to the juvenile authorities and placed in the foster home where he was assured of 24-hour supervision. One of the conditions of his probation was that he received psychiatric aid by a doctor appointed by the court. Dragnet, the story of your police force in action is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. (laughs) 